and I, I must say that you know it was a, a very last minute request that I made to him and with due credit and in immense gratitude to him that he adjusted a lot of his heavy schedule in the courts. He took his hearings, all of them in the hotel today uh, and still managed to be with us. That really means a lot. Anything for you. And Shefali is always the one of the best conversationalists because she reads the book end to end Correct. and then the questions become so much more enriching to uh, everybody. Otherwise, the usual questions that people ask, uh, it really makes very little sense. Uh, and deep gratitude to all the organizing uh, group, Prabodhan Manch, Pune Samvad and the Prabha Khaitan Foundation which has been organizing launches of this book across multiple cities. My immense gratitude to all of them and all you Punekars who have come here on a Friday evening. I forgot it's a working day and a Correct. working evening to come in this large numbers. Uh, the heart is filled with a lot of gratitude today, Shefali. Uh, you said, how are you feeling today? Uh, I must share here that Exactly 16 years ago, uh, in 2008 and in the month of March, that was when I began my literary career with my first book, Splendors of Royal Mysore, uh, the untold story of the Wadiyars that came out at that time. Uh, a lot of people might think, uh, you know, some, something happened only in the last 10 years after a certain climate and so on that was cultivated in the country, but uh, I think my journey began much earlier. Mm -hmm. A very confused 20, mid 20 something who was slogging his way in the corporate sector, not knowing why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, and I thought that is my first book and with that I'll get back to my very boring corporate job. Uh, all the time cursing myself whether, you know, I'm going to die one day, uh, you know, uh, profit and loss statements of some American company which will not add any value to my life or anyone else's life. But thankfully, I think destiny had better plans and this is my ninth book uh, which is uh, there today. Amazing. And this, as you mentioned, Shefali, um, Tipu Sultan was occupying center space in my head. A very, very troublesome uh, story to write. Uh, the, the, all the destruction, all the barbarity. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, yeah. toll even on the person who's writing all of that. But then Mahadev decided to intrude and how. Uh, it was just in a literary festival that I met uh, one of the another dharmic warrior in the legal field, uh, Advocate Vishnu Shankar Jainji. Uh, I mean, God, God bless him and his father, Sri Hari Shankar Jainji, who I think on behalf of all of us, we owe a civilizational gratitude and debt Correct. to uh, this father, son duo. Correct. In that festival, very uh, you know, casually we were chatting and then he uh, said, uh, he's passionate about the topic, uh, as all lawyers are, and he showed me a lot of these documents, uh, including, you know, James Princeps maps of that Ashtamandap, the Bhavya Ashtamandap temple that uh, of Vishveshwar, which was constructed in 1580. And there was also a little bit of pathos in his eyes that, you know, while about Ayodhya, people know, sorry? Uh, I think it's actually hitting it. Yeah, you can keep it forward. Yeah. Forward. Hatmaya, yeah. take <laughs> So while people know a lot about the Ayodhya move, thanks to the movement, I think Gyanwapi, though it keeps coming day in and day out in the newspapers and in channels, a lot of us do not know what the history of this uh, conflict itself is and what is it that we are fighting for. Uh, so uh, I thought it was a historian's you know, burden or responsibility to put this all together in public space. And Vishnuji and I discussed, we'll prob I'll probably write a few articles about it is what initially mm -hmm. was thought. But then once I entered the alley of this Vishwanath Mandir's history, uh, it was so captivating that I realized that articles will not do justice to this. There needed to be a f full length book about this subject. And in a whim I decided, and this is probably the only project which I finished in six months. Uh, wow. It has never happened like this before because each book takes a couple of years of research and Sai knows it considering the tomes that he writes about the amount of research that goes in because you need to be so careful about what you put in there. But I think they say, you know, when your intention is good, the universe somehow conspires. And in this case, when you're writing about Mahadev, uh, you don't need a higher power than that to intervene. Magically, 
magically people started appearing from so many places and I really cannot explain this uh, and I'm being very honest here. Uh, you know, I had the very good fortune of uh, making acquaintance with the Jagadguru Shankaracharya, Sri Sri Abhinava Shankara Bharati ji, the 72nd Pithadipati of the Kudali Shringeri Mahasamsthanam, who got to know I'm writing about this and he uh, got in touch with me. He said, I'd like to speak to you about this, sat over several sessions, explained to me some of the esoteric concepts about what a Shivalinga actually means. He said, it's very important you're writing about Shiva. You also need to explain, is it just phallus worship, uh, you know, organ worship and so on as it is derided? Or what do the Agama Shastra say? What do the Puranas say and so on? And he also introduced me to some Sanskrit pundits in Bangalore. Now, I was very sure that I don't want to refer to the primary sources in translation, especially done by Westerners, uh, with their own biases and, you know, incompleteness. But for us to know Sanskrit, it will take a, uh, you know, a lifetime to master that. So, uh, Dr. H.R. Meera and Professor Kannan in Bangalore, who sat with me, over several weeks and helped me translate the Shiva Puran, the Linga Puran, the Padma Puran, the Skanda Puran, uh, the Brahma Vaivarta Puran, the Vayu Puran and also several Nibandhas in Sanskrit, Kritya Kalpataru uh, by Lakshmi Dhara in the 11th century, Vachaspati Mishra's Tirtha Prakasha, Tirtha Chintamani in the, in the 15th century, Tirtha Prakasha by uh, Mitra Mishra in the 16th century and Tri Sthali Setu by Narayan Bhatt in the 16th century. All this had valuable information about Kashi, about Vishwanath Mandir in particular and the Sthala Mahatmyam. Our history is recorded in these Sthala Mahatmyams which is in Sanskrit and our ignorance of that language, I think, limits our access to that history too. So it was all of this, in addition, the Persian accounts by, uh, you know, people like Al-Baruni, Ibn Battuta, Hassan Nizami, Farishta, Minhaj Siraj, and Aurangzeb's uh, masar e alamgiri by Saki Mustaid Khan. These and also archival records of uh, the British era, uh, colonial records, court records, uh, which are in voluminous amount of the conflict, and post-independence, uh, you know, legal papers, which Vishnuji very generously dumped some 2,000 pages <laughs> on me. And when you are reading legal paper, uh, sorry, uh, sorry about that, I think anyone who is writing in English too will wonder whether you really know English because <laughs> it's so much of legalese which uh, can easily go over your head. So it was really, uh, I think I was seized by some strange energy in those five, six uh, months, staying awake till four, five in the morning. Uh, and constantly writing uh, this uh, book and now when I look back, I even honestly speaking, I sometimes wonder, did I write this? I think you were just a good instrument which made itself available to a higher macro pressure uh, which got this book written. You know, that brings me to your dedication and I think that is probably why you dedicated this book, not to any uh, person but I read it out, to the Lord and Protector of the Universe, Sri Vishwanath, the ruler of Kashi, the Mahasmashana, Anandavana, Rudravasa, and the never abandoned Avimukta Kshetra. As you said, it was a macro pressure group that made you write this book. Yeah. Sai, I'll come to you. Sadhguru, in the prologue to his book, has said that when it comes to Kashi, the when is not as important as what and why. So my question to you is, what is it about Kashi that makes it so important to Bharat, civilizationally? And why is it, why does it matter to each one of us? I mean, we are not in Kashi, we are in Maharashtra. So why does it matter to each one person in this hall who are here today to listen about Kashi? See, as a Shaivite, all I can say is that for me, it is among the holiest. Hmm. Uh, over the last few weeks, I think I've had the opportunity to discuss in detail what is the meaning of holy in the in the context of the of the Hindu civilization under Sampradaya, so to speak? So, can you hear? Yes. Okay. So I certainly believe that you can't think of the history of this land without thinking of Kashi, considering that its dynasty and the city features heavily in our epics, both in Ramayana as well as in Mahabharata. You can't speak of Ramayana and Mahabharata without acti actually referring to Kashi. Two, see it's like this. If tomorrow we had the same conversation in the context of Kamakya or the same conversation in the context of let's say the Bhadrakali Mandir in Varangal 
or uh, any other uh, temple for that matter, you will realize that each of these are indispensable to our tapestry. So when you focus on a particular kshetra, obviously it assumes a certain significance and Kashi of all the places certainly does. But one of the reasons why I am usually careful about bestowing a limited, let's say, exclusivity to a certain set of shrines mm. is because today it has a, a consequence in the public domain. People are waiting to limit the scope of your ask. People are waiting to say thus far and no further. So I would certainly start by saying it is certainly among the holiest without a doubt. But as far as we are concerned, you go and ask certain sadhanas, they will tell you, well, Chidambaram is as holy. Yeah. So one of the reasons why we established these kshetras in multiple places apart from of course the metaphysics of it is that if you were to limit the scope of that energy's presence in one particular place, Bharat has always been among the most populated regions of the world regardless of which period of history you are looking at. When the entire population chooses to go to one place, what does it do to that place? Will it have the ability to bear the resources or does it have the resources to bear the, st the strain of it? So there is a Kashi, then the, there is an Uttar Kashi, there is a Dakshan Kashi. Yeah. Similarly, we have managed to create multiple, let's say, replicas of it with the same kind of sanctity and the same kind of energy. Absolutely. This could be said of it that it's not particularly unique to our civilization because if there's a York, there's a New York, if there's an Orleans, there's a New Orleans, right? Because ultimately America was seen as Nova Europe, which is a reconstruction of the West in the image of Europe, but in a different continent altogether. So I think that is common to the human spirit, where you have certain nerve centers which are seen as holy and you try to replicate them as much as possible. So in that sense, Kashi is certainly important. Now on the when and why, I remember when I used to attend the Vivekananda study circle in um, IIT Kharagpur. Uh, it was led by Professor Joyce Sen, who has written a fantastic book on Aryan Invasion Theory. You should read that. I asked him, why is it that as part of our history reading, we don't focus on the dates? Why don't we focus on the periods when it comes to, let's say, pre-colonial history, pre-Mughal history, so to speak? What, are we ex what is it that we are exactly lacking? Is it fair to say that we don't have a sense of historicity, so on and so forth? Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One, obviously, our conception of time is cyclical. It's not linear. So what makes a difference to us is the moral that the story seeks to present. And even assume for a moment that you come to the conclusion that all of this was a fable or a legend or a myth. Okay, That wouldn't take away from the sanctity of the story itself. One of the things that I think is the strength of the Hindu civilization and Hindu culture, so to speak, is if you take away the historicity of Jesus, Christianity is bound to practically crumble because their entire belief system is based on the reality of it because they want to believe that such a person existed. I'm not getting into whether he existed or not because I'm not in a position to comment on it. But the premise of Christian historiography has been the existence of a figure, a historical figure. That's not the case with us, which is why when you look at the dating of Adi Shankara's life, there are several controversies, whether he was before Buddha, after Buddha, 700 years after Buddha, 2000 years after Buddha, that's very, very unclear. 100% after Buddha, that much is clear, but we are not sure of what is the actual period. Okay, But that hasn't made a difference to people's ability to relate to what he is trying to say. This is as long as you are living in what I would call the pre-modern construct, where this has not <coughs> made a difference to you. So the same set of, let's say, astronomical uh, alignments which are referred to in our books may have happened in multiple cycles of hundreds of years or two thousands of years. We never know that. Which is why when it comes to the dating of Mahabharata, some set of people have a three thousand year figure, some people have a set of five thousand year figures. We are not sure of it. But why has it become relevant now? Because the Abrahamic template requires you to prove something because the approach of the Christian philosophy and Christian ontology is imposed and foisted on Hindus. True. That was absolutely clear in the manner in which we were expected to prove, tell me this is the exact place Sri Ram was born in Ayodhya, in the entire proceeding. Tell us that how do you know this is exactly Sita Maki Rasoi? How do you know that this is, a, this is where he was born? And all sorts of uh, disgusting statements made by the OVC brothers from Bhagyanagar. Okay? So, <laughs> which is why I think now we are forced to confront the reality of proving our faith on the annals of historicity. Okay? 
So I am not disagreeing with Sadhguru's position from a Hindu perspective, okay. but since we are not living in a Hindu worldview and we are expected to meet the requirements of modernity and especially in a court of law which does not subscribe to Hindu philosophy or a Hindu way of looking at it, we have no other option but to look at when, where, how, everything. True. And yet, the very same institution, when tasked with the obligation of identifying on the basis of evidence, who destroyed the original Ram Mandir and when did it happen? conveniently chose not to touch that question whatsoever in the entire judgment which ran into 1045 pages. Everything else is discussed except this. I ask myself this question, if the shoe were in the other foot, would the question have been spared? That's, that's extremely interesting. But having said that, even if we agree to your premise, and I do as a practicing Hindu, that there are energy centers all over the country, and that is why we have so many temples. Each has its own sanctity, each has its own sthana mahatma, each has its own story. But with Kashi Vishwanatha temple, it's very different because there are temples scattered all over India, which are called Kashi Vishwanatha temple. Okay. And it is said that if you visit this temple, if you can't go to Kashi for some reason, you go to Ten Kasi, which Correct. is Dakshinagasi, Correct. and you do darshan there. You go to Khajuraho, there is a Vishwanatha temple. You go to Uttar Kashi, there is a Vishwanatha temple. Even in Pune, do you know that there are three Kashi Vishwanatha temples? They are called Kashi Vishwanatha temples. One is in Dhankaudi, one is in Shivaji Nagar, and one is in Somvar Pet. They are not just called Vishweshwar temple or Vishwanatha temple, they are called Kashi Vishwanatha temple for a reason. And you have dealt with this aspect quite in detail in your book. So would you uh, care to elaborate on why is Kashi Vishwanatha such an important thing for Bharat? In the Skanda Puran, which is the main text, uh, which has a Parishishta called the Kashi Khanda, uh, which de describes in detail the energy structure of Kashi. And as Sai Deepak said, these are energy spaces. And Kashi has been structured in the form of a yantra. It is not, and where at the vertex of that yantra is Vishwanath or Vishweshwara. But there are several other deities which are located. And like a Sri Chakra, at various vertices you have different, uh, you know, um, uh, deities and energy spaces. Uh, for those who say there is no documentation, if you look at the Puranic literature, very, very clearly they say from Vishwanath you go so many coasts uh, to the right, then there is Tarakeshwar, then there is Gangeshwar, Annapurna. then there is Gauri uh, Shankar, there is Annapurna, then there is uh, you know Madhyameshwar and Bhagwan Shiv himself in the Skanda Puran in a uh, dialogue with uh, Parvati Devi says that there are billions of lingas in Kashi which are my Swarupa, as in Hindi, in Kashi, there is a famous saying, say, uh, you know, Kankad, Kankad me Shankar. Everything is Shankar there, and that is why it's called Rudravasa also, the, the city. Uh, but there are 14 major centers which Bhagwan Shiv himself identifies, uh, and that is like a Lingatmak Swarup, like a human, uh, you know, anatomy, mm -hmm. where, you know, the head is Omkareshwar, the eyes are Trilochana, the uh, feet is something else. So there are 14 such major centers, and in that it is said, the two right hands of this Lingatmak Swarup are Vishweshwara and Avimukteshwara. These are the two major, uh, you know, um, energy centers which are very important according to the Puranic literature. And why it is important and why this aspiration to go to Kashi uh, perhaps comes from the fact, again, going back to the Skanda Puran, where Shiva himself tells Parvati that it's like a guarantee that he gives to all the people. You, uh, in the dedication, you said Avimukta Kshetra. Mm -hmm. There is a reason for that word also, two reasons. One is he's so besotted by the beauty of the place when they come. It is said that uh, Shiva's, uh, you know, mother-in-law, uh, Parvati's uh, uh, mother, she said, yeah, this guy is, you know, with all these ganas and all, he has come, where will my daughter go and stay, you know, in the, in a, on a hill in Kailash, w what will she do? And she disparages her son-in-law. And then, according to the Puranic literature, the two, the couple come there and they see this beautiful place, which is also called Anandavana or Ananda Kanana. It is actually Vishnu's, uh, you know, abode. And Vishnu then gives it away to Shiva as his abode, as the fable goes. Uh, and once they land there, he says, I'm never going to abandon this place. So, Avi Mukta, it will be Avi Mukta. And the other guarantee he gives is any mortal uh, person who leaves his or her coils here, 
I will come myself when the soul gets out of the uh, body and chant the Tarak Ram mantra uh, in the years so that Mukti is attained instantly. Just by dying there, you are assured of moksha. Uh, and so the Puranas have some, you know, very macabre uh, advice that if you ever go to Kashi, ask someone to break off your legs so that they don't take you and run away <laughs> because your mind may play silly games with you and you leave when you're getting the biggest lottery ticket in your life. Why would you leave that and go away? Because Nirvana, Moksha, Mukti, these are the main goals of all our Indic faiths, whether it is Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, all of them. So for all these reasons, I think aspirationally people were looking at these seven moksha nagaris, yeah. Ujjain, Kashi, Avantika, well, the Saptapuris, yeah. in that Kashi was important as the abode of uh, Vishweshwar. And in Maharashtra too, uh, in homes, I think there is a, there is a proverb which says, Ka, uh, Kashi is jave nitya vadave, uh, you know, because those days, Maybe it was very difficult to make that huh. journey all the way to Kashi. So the especially the women folk in the homes would say, let's at least keep uttering Kashi is Jave, Kashi is Jave. One day we will go there so that it will manifest. Your speech manifests and your thoughts manifest. So let's go. So that aspirational, uh, you know, um, desire too. And also in this history of uh, Kashi and the Vishwanath temple in particular, which I cover in this book, there are, I think, in the first part, there are two parallel tracks. One is, of course, the history of all these iconoclasm, destructions, all these terrible things that we hear, which is very difficult to document and to read. But alongside, there is another one, which is of hope, which is of resilience, which is of the fact that every part of India contributed all through the centuries to that reconstruction of this sacred spot for this particular reason, that this meant a lot to us. And we'll talk more about those resilience, uh, you know, in the uh, midst of all odds that they faced. But just see, even in the 18, 19th century, you had in distant Kerala, the Travancore Maharaja Swati Tirunal, who probably never left his uh, hometown, Padmanabhapuram, uh, um, went only up to Alipe or he so. Sung in favor of he sung a bhajan called Vishweshwara Darshan Kar Chalaman Tum Kashi. Amrita Venkatesh's performance on that is fantastic. I've yes, seen that. Yes, yeah. in Sindhu Bhairavi Rag. Yeah. So it's a, uh, so across and Today we are talking of north-south divide, the south is different, the north is culturally different. The uh, Swati Tirunal Maharaja didn't think that oh, this is some Uttar Pradesh, some language which I don't understand. This aspirational, uh, you know, uh, goal of resurrecting Kashi, going there, whether it was Maharashtra, whether it was Kerala, whether it was the east, all over. And that is what I think makes a nation to all these people who say we were not even a nation Correct. and the British gave us a sense of nationality. Yeah. What else? is that common sense of emotional attachment to a set of uh, so many spaces which did I think multiple things. One is of course the faith, the spirituality, but it also welded us all with that sense of patriotism and nationalism. And as Sai said, no parochialism. I mean if I felt my place was the most uh, sacred, there were hundred others in other parts which were equally, equally. Uh, sacred. So I think that is why all through the long history of this uh, important uh, you know, uh, Tirtha Kshetra, uh, there was the whole of India, the whole of Bharat has contributed to its resurrection and reconstruction. See, even today uh, in uh, Upanayanam Samskars in Goa, Karnataka, Maharashtra also probably, the boy says he is going to Kashi, Kashi Yatra, and the like Kashi wedding, Yatra. Wedding yeah, and in correct. Tamil Nadu, they do it in weddings, correct. but in Maharashtra, Karnataka, they do it in uh, the Upanayanam Samskaram. In, in Surat, somebody told me that they wanted me to taste the food of Surat, so they said that there is a saying here that Surat no Jaman or Kashi no Maran. And this <laughs> saying has been there for hundreds of years, saying that you should eat in Surat, but you should die in Kashi. But that that concept of Kashi being sacred, being right. holy, matters a lot. I want to ask you a different question. See, there is always uh, this narrative being played that, uh, okay, maybe the Islamic invaders may have destroyed a few temples in India, but so what? Even Hindus destroy... I'm saying, I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate here, but so what, you know, uh, Hindus uh, destroyed Buddhist temples, you know, they never coexisted or whatever. But if you read your book, you will see that Kashi particularly, at the same time, was a place that was sacred to the Buddhists, it was sacred to the Jains, it was sacred to the Hindus, it was also sacred enough for uh, Guru Nanak, I think, also went there for a pilgrimage, right? So it was sacred for all faiths, and this was happening parallelly, and you have mentioned in your book, about the Ghadvela king, uh, 
uh, Govindratna, who had both his wives, they were actually practicing Buddhists and he was a practicing Hindu, and also about Huen Sang's uh, descriptions. So could you talk a little bit about how Kashi was the sacred nucleus for all Bharatiya Pants, not just, not just Dharma, not just uh, Hindu Dharma rather? This Buddhist thing comes up only <laughs> very curiously when there is a Hindu demand India. for a Hindu reclamation. <laughs> Rest of the time, the, the Buddhist claims are in great stupor. Correct. Uh, Correct. So, I, I think a couple of months back, uh, when this case was also gathering momentum, you had uh, Irfan Habib uh, come out to the quint, I think, and say, at least for the first time, he agreed that there was a mandir to toda gaya tha, but wo Shivji ka mandir tha ya nahi pata nahi hai. Huh. So, I mean, you know, the Masre Alamgiri, uh, 1669 September, says very clearly that as per the Badshah's orders, we have destroyed all the temples in Kashi, including that of Vishnath, uh, Vishwanath ka apabhransh, Vishnath. Now, uske baad, what more you want? You are keeping that segue open so mm -hmm. that you can say under that there was some other structure, there was uh, all these falsehoods which uh, come up in um, you know, to just deny the Hindus their claim. But if you come to the history, as you mentioned, Shefali, uh, right from beginning, so within the Hindu sampradayas, all the different panthas that were there, as I said, it was Vishnu, uh, Bhagwan Vishnu's Kshetra, and he gave it away to Shiva. Uh, and so even now in the Moksha Vilas Mandir in Vishwanath, the first among the Panchayatan Pujas that have to be done there, it is for Lakshmi Narayan which is done first before you go to Vishwanath. Uh, and the Shakta traditions have survived there. Manikarnika Ghat is where uh, uh, Sati's earring is yeah. supposed to have fallen, and that's where the Mahasmashana, the 24 by 7 Chita Chitayan Jo Jalti Rehti Hai Maape, yeah. that also happens there. Uh, but alongside the other, even the Nastika Panthas, whether it was Buddhism or Jainism, uh, the Buddha gave his first sermon in Varanasi, just outside at Saranath, yeah. uh, in the deer park, uh, and it was called the Dharma Chakra Pravartana, where five people first, uh, you know, uh, moved over to his side, and from there, literally, uh, he went, uh, the, the, the message was carried over all through. So, obviously, it was, it was a place already of such theological importance that even the Buddha thought, you have to come there and give your pravachan to gain a kind of an acceptance all over. The Jain, uh, you know, Tirthankaras, right from Parshvanath, Parshvanath was born there. Uh, some other Suparshwa was also born in Varanasi. Mahavira is supposed to have come there. Lot of Jina scholars uh, came and uh, you know, preached there in Kashi. Uh, you have some of their accounts too, which uh, which also talk about a Vishwanath Mandir and how important uh, it was. And within the Hindu, the several other panthas, uh, Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, uh, and of course the Vallabhacharya. Vallabhacharya also lived in Kashi. You had the Ramanandi, you had the Kabir Panthis, you had uh, the Virashaivas, the Lingayats, you had the Gorak uh, Panthi, uh, you know, Tantric uh, Akhadas, Mahanirvani Akhadas, all these who made it a part. So, one place which is actually a microcosm <laughs> of the whole of India. Almost every region, every ruler had some construction done there, uh, had some imprint. So, uh, literally a smaller version, a mini India so to say. Uh, as you mentioned, Hyun Sang comes in the 7th century and in his account which I quote in the book, yeah. he says very clearly that, uh, you know, it's a thriving place for Buddhist uh, you know, uh, traditions. There are about uh, 30 stupas and about 300 monks uh, who are there and these stupas are magnificent. There is a golden statue of the Buddha. All of that is happening. This is in the periphery of the uh, city, but inside there are the non-believers of the Buddha who worship Mahadev, who is the presiding deity. There is a huge temple with a statue which is almost 100 feet uh, tall uh, and almost you feel like it's a living entity. So, 7th century, there was coexistence. You spoke about the Gahadwal king, uh, Govinda Chandra, who uh, was a Vaishnav by practice, but then he richly patronized Shaiva uh, temples, obviously, Avimukteshwar, Vishweshwar, all of that. And two of his wives were Buddhist. So, obviously, there was no marital discord, I am sure, and there was no uh, case of a divorce happening there. So, so you could be, a, the husband could be a Vaishnava who then patronizes a Shaiva temple and his wives are Buddhist. And this is 11th century, just a few decades before Kutubuddin Aibak's, uh, you know, sword, which actually, the sword of Islam, which uh, broke the back of Buddhism, uh, because the Buddhist tradition was a monastic order. So, once you break the monastery, 
the faith crumbles. Whereas in our case, there were thousands of different panthas, sampradayas. How much will you kill? How much will you destroy? There is always a resurgence which will keep happening. So I think once and for all, there has to be, we must put to rest this Buddhist Hindu strife, which I think is done only and only by vested interests with no historical value. There could have been one or two some rare, uh, rare instances of some king, Pushyamitra Shunga and so on, which again is uh, highly uh, disputed. But did it have any theological sanction like it uh, had in the case of Islamic iconoclasm? The answer is a sure no. My next question is to you, Sai. Uh, both uh, Meenakshi Jain's book and Vikram's book talk about the repeated attacks, repeated desecrations of Kashi and the temples of Kashi and the indomitable spirit of the people of Kashi who kept rebuilding, who kept claiming the sacred spaces, they never let go. And this is not unique just to Kashi. You see the story repeated all over India where there have been temples destroyed and people have reclaimed the place almost immediately after the invaders have left and maybe they didn't have the money to build temples that were as big but they have at least put their dev devas and devatas in small makeshift places and continued the worship. In my little village in Goa which was attacked by the Portuguese for 10 years and they destroyed the main temple there at least three times which is documented. The people just scattered, they lived in the forest but when the Portuguese forces left, they came back, they rebuilt the temple. So this rebuilding and reclaiming the sacred sp spaces happened all over India. My question to you is bigger than Kashi, to what do you attribute this resilience, this tenacity of Hindus to claim, reclaim, come back and never leave their sacred spaces? Can I connect this with the previous question to Vikram? Sure. See, if you look at how the weaponization of Buddhism against uh, the Vedic religion has been orchestrated significantly, there are two things that I think the British period successfully did. Every uh, Panth, uh, whether it was Astik or Nastik, was always presented in reference to what they call the Brahminical religion, one way or the other. Hmm. Okay? So therefore, they would see Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism as egalitarian, casteless deviations and departures or even revolts against Brahminical orthodoxy. That was their way of looking at it. The problem with this entire historiography is one, Buddha is crystal clear in his belief as far as Varnavayavastha is concerned. Hmm. He himself says that the next person to lead the Sangha will be a Kshatriya, so much so, because he comes from a Kshatriya Kula. Yeah. He chastises women for having intermarried in different castes. He chides them for this. Yeah. So where is this casteless notion of Buddhism coming from is something that we have to ask ourselves. Second, as Vikram rightly says, they may reject the Veda as the primary pramana as far as their belief system is concerned, but the rest of the values of Hindu philosophy which are traceable to the Vedic religion significantly are taken over. That is actually true of most movements across the world, wherein you will see communism and let us say protestant movements taking Christian values, rejecting only the establishment of the Catholic Church. Hmm. That happens every other, in every other society. Now why is this crucial? that there is no scriptural animosity that is taught as part of the faith systems. But remember one thing, the contestation between different Pants, Dharmic Pants so to speak, was virulent with respect to who believes that who is right. Language actually would defeat every provision of the Indian penal code today in the way they refer to themselves. Okay. Abuses are hurled freely. Nobody in the family is paired. Okay? Left, right and center it goes. But the thing is, that is the extent to which the, fa the society has been tolerant, where the ideas are so dearly held that they contest very, very vociferously. Now, what has not happened, at least as a result of scriptural sanction, as he rightly says, is destruction of the other place of worship. Hmm. Now, when someone says, what do you do of those instances if you continue digging and you find a Buddhist place? I would say, or thoda khudai karlo, aapko pe phir ek mandir dik jayega. <laughs> Bas ek level baki hai. You know why? Mm -hmm. One of the first, let's say, temple destructions which was ordered in the history of Bharat, way before the Islamic invader came, 
was by certain radical Buddhist missionaries. Okay, that is a fact. So when someone says, you will find something then, I said, hai, hey, let's go, take it to the logical conclusion, go a step further, no problem, let's see where this goes. Okay, assume for a moment at the core of it, you find only a Buddhist stupor, please take it, no problem. Hindu okay. mind will accept it because we are for the truth, very clear. Second, the weaponization of Buddhist history starts around the Ram Janabhumi movement by scholars like R.S. Sharma, D.N. Jha, Irfan Habib, so on and so forth, because they are hell-bent on actually stifling your claim by putting up another claim. Yeah. Now, you'll, you'll get a concrete example and you'll be able to relate it to now. Nobody gives a damn about Hindu diversity until the Uniform Civil Code is brought about. Yeah. <laughs> until the conversation starts, they will say, Are, there is so much of diversity within you, what will happen to the tribal in Assam, what will happen to the tribal in Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh. Suddenly, all sorts of people who never care about them start talking for their voices because one is used to defeat the other argument. That is exactly the strategy behind the propping up of the Buddhist argument insofar as our claims are concerned. I have said this before. They came to the court with a petition specifically saying that even Sabarimala temple is a Buddhist temple when the arguments are going on in the Supreme Court. Tirupati also. Tirupati. Yeah. Every temple for that matter. Hmm. Okay. So, I am saying... If you are so keen on presenting your case, why can't you stand on your own two feet? Why is it that you suddenly come as a plant only when the Hindu chooses to assert his claim? That is mighty convenient. Which is why the history and the politics of history is something that most people don't understand. Unfortunately, some of our own people don't understand because they constantly say, Arre, Arre, you dig deeper, you'll find something there, don't do it, nothing of that sort should be done. Limit your claims to only three. Sorry, no. If you have the confidence and you believe in history, then this can't be compromised. Now I'll come to your actual question to me. And this has been my repeated, let's say, exhortation to the Hindu community. Our arguments start, uh, with respect to reclamation, start from politics, go to culture, at best go to society. We don't think on a metaphysical level at all. We have stopped thinking about our temples from a metaphysical perspective or an ontological perspective or a spiritual perspective. Okay. The reason why our ancestors fought so much gave up everything is because for them our devatas were real entities very real entities who are relatable in the form of a family member so which is why the destruction of a murti would lead to literally vidva vilap okay where you're literally looking at what has happened this is my community this is my devata i've, I've been protecting it for so many years families would be dedicated for the protection of it in one way or the other in different aspects the secularization of Hindu mind, thanks to the education that we have been, let's say, subjected to is the word that I would use, is the reason for the reduced levels of attachment to our own Kshetras, where you can see a stark difference between the 1990 RJB movement to Kashi today, where I would say, other than the efforts of gems like Vishnu and his father, Mr. Harishankar Jain, honestly, it has not still got the same traction as the Ramjana Bhumi movement, which is why I would hope that this book sparks a movement when people read this and realize mm. that at the end of the day, <laughs> politics will do what it, is, what it wants to, institutions will do whatever they have to to protect constitutional morality. Our dharmic morality, it is only for us to protect and this cannot happen unless and until we put faith in the concept of Hindu metaphysics and we actually believe that sadhana is an important aspect of our personal lives. All this talk is useless. See, let's look at it this way. He could have written this book purely from a neutral, objective, scientific, modern perspective. That is the tourist's view of Indian culture. You come here, take a camera, I have to see the snake charmer. He could have done the very same thing. Now what is the difference? What is the X factor? He is able to relate to the invasions and he subjected himself to the torture of it. I know exactly what he means because each time you read that literature, your blood boils and you don't know how to consume it and you have no idea what it is going to do to your own psyche. It's best that people actually stay away from their families when they're actually writing such books. <laughs> because it takes a toll on you. You know for a fact that you're not going to be patient, you're not going to be normal at all. Now, am I asking the rest of the society to, be, uh, to become like that once they read this book? Yes. 100% <laughs> yes. If you do not relate to your ancestors in this fashion, 
you will not be able to meet the other side's commitment to its faith, person for person, man for man, woman for woman, child for child. Absolutely. And that is what you're looking at. So I am very clear about the fact that if the Hindu society's primary point of view and primary prism is going to be political, cultural, civilizational, which we constantly use euphemistically, and never religious or spiritual, then this is a half-baked exercise which will never be taken to its logical conclusion because the invasions from the other side will continue. The only thing that kept us constantly alive and we rebuilt was the Astha. That Astha has to be revived under any circumstances. That's very, very well said. I just want to add, I just want to, add to this. Uh, two things. One is on the Buddhist part. The second one I'll address first. Uh, adding to what Saidipak said, why, people may ask us, what is so important about that site? Right? We can construct it somewhere else, hospital, uh, school, banado, this and that, which keeps uh, coming uh, all the time. That's only. Yeah. But all through the, uh, you know, the history of this temple, particularly, and that's what I think the Shankaracharya, uh, his idea was, uh, Jagat Guru's, when he you know, also explain to me some of the Agama Shastras and the Marichi Samhita, Vishnu Samhita and some of these other Vastu, uh, you know, documents where it says the, the, the basic theological difference between a Hindu Mandir, a Devasthanam and it's called Devasthan and a Masjid. There's a fundamental difference where here it is a Prana Pratishthit Murti. And Correct. as he said, it is a living entity. You are uh, invoking the divine in the form of an idol Avahanam. and avahanam and then making it a part of your family. And that's why there is Nitya Pujas, like you would wake up a person with Suprabhatam and then uh, Naivedyas all through the day, lots of things to eat, Shayan uh, Puja, Shayan, put, Shayan Puja put them to uh, bed, all of that and various, uh, you know, uh, Shiva does not have, but Vishnu is Alankara Priya. So you have all kinds of Alankarams, Utsavams, and that's how the entire culture revolved around that living entity. And when you say we're going to a temple to have Darshan, it is that deity's house that we are going as common people, just as I'd come to your house, abide by your rules and not impose mine in your house and meet you, have an interview with you, so to say. But uh, a mosque, on the other hand, is a place of congregation, which is a place of worship, but people congregate and there is no Pran Pratishthit Murti there. So even in Muslim countries, very routinely, mosques get uh, translocated for mundane things like laying a railway line or widening a road and that is possible. Whereas here the belief uh, among the Astikas… They did that to the central mosques itself there yeah, in Makkah. In Makkah, yes. So the belief here is when you have done the avahan of the deity in that place, unless you do a vidhivat visarjan of the deity, that energy is still imbued in that place Correct. till eternity. And that's why once a Hindu temple, always a Hindu temple. Correct. Now, in Maharashtra, Ganesh Puja is done on the Anand Chaturdashi, you do a Vidhivat Visarjan of Ganesh Ji and then you uh, immerse the idol. Same with Durga Puja in Bengal. Yeah. But just if you cut off the head of that deity or remove it, that place is still imbued with the divinity, with the energy is what we believe in. And so even in this book, you know, uh, there is a very evocative uh, passage from the Tristhali Setu of Narayan Bhatt, uh, who was instrumental in getting the uh, temple reconstructed in the 16th century um, with Raja Todarmal's uh, help during Akbar's reign. And he says, he, he has a very nice... Uh, you know, pathos filled advice to all the devout. He says, don't lose hope that Mahadev is not there. By virtue of the fact that once this ground had his deity, uh, you know, invoked there, the land is sacred. So even, and the phrase he uses is Dushtam Lech Chadi Rajas, in the evil Muslim uh, rule of these uh, uh, sultans, if the deity is not there, it is broken, it is hidden, that still that place is significant, the land itself is significant. And so when nobody is watching, the soldiers are not having surveillance, you go quietly, you do your Nitya Karmas, parikramas. you do your Parikramas, you take water from the Ganga. If nobody is watching, you just put some, you can't do an elaborate uh, Rudra Bishekam and all that. So you just put some water. If uh, you get the chance, then put some flowers or some Akshata. And that is the same template we find even in Ayodhya. Uh, if there was a Ram where people would go and cry from the Sarayu, they would take water, go and put it there. 
and say this is the Ram Janmasthan and so we believe that intergenerational memory and faith that gets transmitted. So he says don't lose hope and but have the hope that one day Mahadev will come back. And these things, <laughs> Sai Deepak mentioned how our historical facts are couched you know in story form. In the uh, you know Skanda Puran, the Linga Puran, there is this wonderful story, and these were composed maybe around 13th to 15th centuries by when Mahadev's temple had gone, and so there is this uh, you know reference to Shiva being in exile. Uh, you know, Mahadev, who, who can have the temerity to put him to exile from his holy city of Kashi and there is someone called Divodasha who comes and occupies this place and Shiva does all kinds of tricks and this and that and he sends several uh, you know gods and goddesses, the yoginis, the Chonsat yoginis, all of them come to trick Divodasha to get Kashi back but they get so enamored by Kashi that they settle down there and they form temples of them Finally, even Ganesha fails, then finally Vishnu comes disguised as a Buddhist monk uh, and then tricks uh, the, <laughs> so there's a subtle reference to that too. And finally, Divodasha is thrown away and in uh, there is a grand celebration, there is a welcoming back of Mahadev into his own holy city. So there is always that hope that is given to the Astikas that don't, don't forget that this is that holy spot and this is what you need to reclaim and have that flame of hope in your heart that one day you will get it back. Now the other part that he mentioned about the Buddhist thing, uh, there again the you know Sanskrit the, the problem is we don't get into the uh, nuances in uh, Sanskrit one word can have 20 meanings depending on the context. context if you take it at literal face value you can go for a completely uh, different connotation there are some leftist historians in uh, Ashoka University who've written a book on uh, Shankaracharya uh, Adi Shankaracharya and in that so they say Kumarila Bhatta the, the disciple of Shankara who actually infiltrated the Buddhist monasteries learnt all their uh, you know theology and then defeated them in Logic. Shastrat and uh, Vad Vivad which is our uh, regular uh, how he defeated Mandana Mishra and so on so constantly there was a lot of contestation but how is this in Sanskrit mentioned that there were hundred Buddhist monks and Kumarila Bhatta went and cut off all their heads and you know the uh, he made powder of their skulls and blew this uh, you know ashes in all the four directions and this crazy uh, leftist historians say there was a mass <laughs> genocide of uh, Buddhist monks by Kumarila Bhatta sanctioned by Adi Shankaracharya. The poor Adi Shankara would not even have killed a fly. <laughs> now he is accused of a genocide of 100 Buddhist monks. Mm -hmm. So what does that actually mean? That means the ego, you know, he, uh, the ego which is represented by the skull, how Kali is holding it and all of that, he demolished that and blew it away. So that is an Upama Alankar. You take it at literal face value, then obviously everything is a genocide. The Durga Saptashati will also sound like a bloodbath. Uh, so I think there is a, especially if you have to access, I think, the history of Bharat, you will have to go to the classical languages and access them in the original with Vidwans and Vidushis who will understand that language, Sanskrit, right. Prakrit, Pali, Sen Tamil, all these languages. Otherwise, uh, you know, in literal lost in translation, that is what is going to happen. Can I just you add know, to one, just one point to yeah. what you're saying? So the distinction between the mosque and the temple that Vikram points out is the specific subject of the discussion in Ismail Faruqi versus Union of India, which was contested in the context of Ram Bhumi to identify what are the distinctions. Hmm. So there, the Indian judiciary has specifically recognized this distinction, that one is a place of congregation, the other is a place of worship. worship, what is the meaning of Prana Pratishtha, so on and so forth. What is the difference between desecration and uh, as he calls it, deconsecration, which is visarjan. So the uh -huh. Khandit Murti is still capable of being worshipped. There's nothing that stops you. I just want to add one point. When people say that we don't have a way of memorializing our history, our rituals are actually a way of doing yes. it. So when Apad Dharma kicks in, which is at the time of calamity, we actually invent rituals to actually address that situation so that that ritual keeps the memory alive. I don't know how many people practice Sandhya Hundan. If you do, hmm. You will specifically speak of the Sarpasatra sacrifice that was conducted at the end of the war later by the descendants of Abhimanyu from Parikshit so on and so forth. And the promise given to Astika with respect to the Nagas, all of that is transmitted as part of the 32 or 40 steps which are part of the Sandhya Vandana. So you will see references to Mahabharata as part of your Sandhya Vandana. Imagine the continuity of the tradition. 
So this is not a bunch of people sitting together to try and tomes. We did that, but Khilji came and destroyed even that. So when people say, where is your history, where is your history, go search for it in the ashes of Nalanda before asking this question. Go search for it in the ashes of different places. But to precisely avoid this, we had a plan B. Plan B is oral tradition. And that oral tradition means that you have, so what was done today, I think Ganapati was also done today. So you have that. Ganapati is actually, to put it in today's terms, a blockchain way of understanding your entire structure so that you, you started from any, uh, in, let's say any uh, syllable or any line, you will still be able to remember the rest of it. Yeah. Because conventional memory does what? If you forget a line, what do you start? These people don't need that. They will start from the very same syllable that they forget and they'll go from there. And that is their way of actually creating critical additions. Four different people or 15 different people coming from different directions will sit together and the one who's out of sync is actually wrong. That's the way of testing it. So we have had our own knowledge structures to actually keep everything alive. History has been passed on. We have become collective amnesiacs, civilizational amnesiacs, because we have consumed education which has been imposed on us to such an extent that we don't relate to the frameworks of our ancestors whatsoever, their value systems whatsoever. Therefore, we are brown Englishmen looking at Indians, or Hindus for that matter. That is one of the reasons that this entire uh, movement for Indic knowledge systems. So he em emphasizes on skill sets, on knowledge of language, so on and so forth. I, I just add to that point. If you don't relate to Hindu darshana, there is no way that even these skill sets can help you because what is important is the chashma that you're wearing to look at the same set of facts. If I choose to, let's say, change the prism with which I'm looking at it, the same set of facts will lead to two different conclusions. Ask any lawyer, he'll tell you how that is done. <laughs> you know, Vikram, I'm glad you spoke about Narayan Bhatta and particularly for this audience, I would like to tell you that Gaga Bhatta, who presided over uh, Shivaraj Abhishek, was actually Narayan Bhatt's grandson. I want you to talk a little bit about the contribution of Maharashtrians, both to the cultural resurgence of Kashi at a time when Kashi was being not having such a great time, basically, and also about the, the post Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj period, when every Maratha ruler tried their best to basically liberate Kashi and to build the temple there, which finally Ahilabai Holkar did. Yes. Just a few lines before that uh, about mm -hmm. the other, like in the, my opening remarks, I also mentioned how the whole of India uh, contributed to its reconstruction. Uh, 1194, the most brutal acts on Kashi by Kutubuddin Aibak, thousand temples destroyed, Hassan Nizami mentions uh, this and says all the wealth was laden on 18 camels and 300 elephants and taken away from there and so on. 1194. But by 1212, hardly what, uh, less than two decades, from Bengal, you had a ruler there, uh, the Sena ruler Vishwarupa, who comes there, it's the height of the Delhi Sultanate. So obviously he could not build back a big yeah. temple again. So he uh, erects a uh, stamba there, right in the heart of Kashi and says this city belongs to Vishweshwar. I'm stamping my authority right now, uh, you know, uh, that this is ours. This is 1212. So, b but by 1240 CE, 1250, you had a Gujarati businessman, so East Eastern India has contributed to it, now Western India's chance. So Gujarati businessman called Seth Vastupala, who comes and gives one lakh rupees in those days, uh, you know, to rebuild this beautiful grand structure uh, back in the same spot. And by 1270, just see the progression of how quickly, with less than a century, you had from Southern India, a Hoysala king, Veera Narasimha III, who donates an entire village called Hebale uh, to, so that the uh, revenue, the proceeds that came from there could go to the pilgrims to pay the jizya tax. So by then the jizya had already come in, the pilgrims who had to go to visit our own uh, shrines, we had to pay uh, tax to the Sultanate. So he says all the proceeds from here are donated to the, uh, to the uh, lotus feet of Mahadev. And these repeated 
you know, uh, invasions, the attacks, Aibak, then Razia Sultan, then you had the Jaunpur uh, Nawabs of Razia the Sharki, Mosque. Razia Mosque that is there, uh, which is considered as the original, original site site. of yeah. Vishw Vishwanath. Okay. Uh, and the uh, Khiljis, then Sikandar Lodi, all these was going on. So Kashi, which was also the center for Sanskrit scholarship, all the scholars started moving down to southern India for, uh, you know, say for pastures. But at that time, in the midst of so many troubles that Kashi had, four Maharashtrian Brahmin families, the Shesha, Mauni, Bhatta and Dharmadikari, they migrated from this area and went to Kashi, circumventing all these challenges and staying there to create a resurrection of the knowledge systems and Sanskrit scholarship and also create a uh, consciousness for Kashi and its importance. So the Kashi Khanda, the Kashi Rahasya as a Parishishta to the Brahma Vaivarta Puran. Then the Vayu Puran had this uh, Ananda Kanana Mahatmyam as a Parishishta or appendix. All this knowledge renaissance that, uh, you know, after the Crusades you had the renaissance. Here our renaissance was in this way. And the best part was that was translated to multiple languages. Uh, uh, you know, there was a Kavi, Srinatha Kavi. Translated to Tamil, my language? Uh, <laughs> our <laughs> language rather. Yes. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't, don't have a reference, but Tamil was, I think, the court language all of, thanks to the Vijayanagar Empire. Uh, Srinatha translates Kashi Khanda to Telugu. Uh, and uh, you had Tenali Rama's son-in-law, the Rama Kavi, who again translates the Vayu Puran Parishishta to Telugu. The Guru Charitra in Maharashtra in the 15th yeah. century, that has an entire uh, chapter on Kashi Mahatmya, what is that Panchakroshi Yatra that I mentioned, all these different parts the, uh, of the Yantra, what all you have to go and pay obeisance. The Guru Charitra, uh, you know, had that uh, reference. And so not only in the political sphere, in the cultural, in the spiritual, in the religious uh, sphere also, the need to reclaim it, uh, not only physically, but also intellectually, that was constantly there. And naturally when Kashi Vishwanath Mandir was destroyed, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was alive. And it is said that uh, he and his mother, uh, Mata Jijabai, were so enraged and she said, if you are man enough, uh, your, the duty of your life is to reclaim Kashi Vishwanath temple. And it is said on his deathbed. Jyotirlingas, uh, yeah. he wanted yeah. all, yeah. all the Jyotirlingas, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. resurrected on his deathbed when he was asked, you make your after journey happily. He's supposed to have said, how can I be happy when, when Kashi, Kashi Vishwanath yes. is still in shackles? And so that... Jai! Jai. So that stream, I think, uh, uh, what the cultural renaissance had put in, the political masters obviously were uh, also, you know, inspired by that. And so the entire Maratha Samrajya uh, was uh, prefaced on this, that we need these sacred spaces back. And Dr. Uday Kulkarni is here and in his books too on the Peshwas, he mentions uh, clearly how, whether it was Bajirao Peshwa, yes. Nana Sahib Peshwa, Every all of them Peshwa, yeah, yes. kept making these demands saying, negotiating first with the Mughals and the Awadh Nawabs and the East India Company, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was Warren Hastings, even Cornwallis, uh, you know, in the third Anglo-Mysore war when Nana Fadnavis mm -hmm. is having a, uh, you know, alliance with the British against Tipu Sultan. Uh, one of the clauses he says is, allow us to get Kashi, Prayag, Gaya, all these important spaces back. Of course, it is rejected. Yeah. But the trial was constantly there. Many people on social media, the Marathas were so great, why did they not take these things back? Of course, it didn't belong to them. So only through negotiations, there couldn't be a war that could be uh, waged to get these back. They kept on trying. And Madhavrao Peshwa, who died, I think, yeah. at the age of 26, 27, in his will, there are three points related to Kashi. Kashi and yeah. the first part is he pledges all his descendants that this is your sacred duty to reclaim this, uh, you know, um, uh, temple back. And Malharao Holkar uh, mm. actually takes an entire army to Kashi to destroy the Gyanwapi uh, Masjid. And then the Brahmins there, they prevail upon him and say, you will destroy and go away, but we will be, you know, uh, mm -hmm. led to the wolves uh, by these uh, sultans. So don't do this. And so he, uh, you know, junks the idea. And Dr. Kulkarni mentioned to me that there was another attempt, a very unknown attempt, uh, which in 1755, uh, though 1669, Aurangzeb destroys this uh, temple. 
but even in his own lifetime, a smaller shrine had already come up. And you have references of the Rajput kings, the Maharaja of Reva, the Udaipur Rana, the Jaipur uh, Maharaja, all of these people coming there in stealth, going and worshipping a small shrine. Now that shrine too was destroyed in 1755 by a local Kazi who wanted to show I am more uh, committed to the faith than the Badshah. And so he destroys it and it is said the Peshwa's guru, uh, Narayan Dikshit Patankar, he sits on a fast unto death saying this is sacrilege that has happened and the Peshwa himself has to prevail upon him to uh, give up the fast. All the shopkeepers had abandoned, all the Hindu shopkeepers went in protest in 1755. So naturally, I think Ahilya Bai Holkar, Devi Ahilya Bai Holkar was sagacious. She didn't take the confrontationist route. She purchased so it. She purchased that land and then there's so many stories that the original Jyotirling was not destroyed by Aurangzeb, that the uh, Brahmin priest got to know it was removed and uh, kept in the Gyanavapi well and then this was brought back and so many stories there is no uh, documented evidence of that. But she just constructed a uh, shikhara over it and built the current structure that you see there, the temple structure is built by her. And it was gold plated by Maharaja Ranjit, Ranjit Singh, Singh in 1836. The same story of how the Sikhs, uh, you know, who hmm. uh, today Hindus and Sikhs are different, Khalistan and all of that. Uh, Guru Gobind Singh sends Guru, people to yeah. actually learn the Vedas from the Kashi. Yes, and Guru Nanak goes to Ayodhya, go, talks about Ram, about Durga, about Devi and all of that. And, you know, Ranjit Singh, uh, when he defeats Ahmad Shah Durrani, uh, around what, 1798, 99, he clearly makes a uh, uh, claim to him after the defeat that the Somnath Mandir uh, door, door yeah. that should be returned, returned to us. Now just think about this. It was destroyed in 1025 by Mahmud Ghazni. This is 1798 or so. 800 years have passed. He's a young man in his 20s. But that memory is still there that that was our sacred spot. Even the Dwar is so important that we want that Dwar back. In his will, he wills away the Kohino to Jagannath Mandir no. after having purchased it. Yeah. So actually, as opposed to let's say state claimants, the entity that has the claim as of now is the Jagannath yeah. Mandir because the last true owner willed it off in his will. So, so yeah, so this has been the constant story of resilience, of reclamation and this never say die. So I think that is what should instill in us that sense of hope too, uh, not just the Vidhva Vilap about, you know, oh, it's actually uh, been destroyed because our ancestors never, never gave up. And so we have no right to give up, not on one, two, three, on any number which uh, we can actually produce the evidence for. Let's move a little bit. Let's go fast forward to 1809 where one of the worst riots in Kashi happened and where the lot of Bhairav was destroyed and where the Hindus of the city, they all got together regardless of whatever their denominational differences or caste differences and fought as one. Uh, when I was reading that chapter in your book, it really boiled my blood and it was difficult for me to even read. So I can imagine as a historian to, for you to actually go through all the evidence and read it and write about it without feeling that emotional connect. I don't know how you do it. How do you remain objective as a historian and write about these things that make your blood boil is something that's you know difficult to fathom. But could you talk a little bit about the 1809 riots and because they, it's a very important uh, chapter. So that, uh, so the best part is of the British era to which we have come is now you have documentation. You have clear records in the courts. Now the Hindus never gave up on that site, constantly skirmishes, registrations in courts. But 1810, you had, as you, 1809 was mm. the Lat Bhairav. So just near the Vishwanath Mandir, a little distance away, there's this Kapal Mochan Tirth, where it was believed that when, you know, Brahma's fifth uh, head was chopped, chopped off, off by Shiva and he uh, brings it there, that is the place where the Kapal Mochan, off, yeah. actually, the, the, the skull falls off and that's the Tirth. And just on its uh, banks, you have the uh, a Lat or a pillar of Bhairav. And that is the place where the Ashta Bhairavs, uh, all of them, uh, are supposed to come and there is one uh, pindi for each of them. Now the, uh, the, and it is just surrounded by another mosque and that is occupied completely by the Julaha or the weaver community of uh, the Muslims of Varanasi. And they were constantly making 
attempts to encroach this property which is there even now uh, not only the Vishwanath Mandir there is the Bindu Madhav Mandir which has been yeah. taken over there are so many others uh, Kriti Vaseshwar all of these you know encroached by some other masjid now this particular place it was uh, um, you know uh, the place for a lot of the tantric pujas and the Gosains the Nath Sampraday uh, yogis and others so they were not the ones who would uh, take all this lying down. So they were constantly pushed back and once this conflagration happened in 1809 where an entire Muslim army comes uh, you know to come and actually break Kashi Vishwanath temple and then the Rajputs uh, in uh, uh, Varanasi under Ratan Singh and several others they form a counter army and there is a pitched battle uh, to defend Kashi Vishwanath and the Muslim army is actually defeated and sent back and the British uh, they are looking at all of this with horror like what is happening and you know they just don't know how to control this now once they are defeated and gone and the Hindus forgot about Lat Bhairav they were giving night vigil to the Vishwanath Mandir so that the attackers don't come so in uh, in a uh, light of this thing they go to the Lat Bhairav and a cow is slaughtered there and uh, the blood is sprinkled everywhere and into the Ganga into the Kapal Mochan and the Lat itself is uh, broken down and all kinds of desecration happens and that night apparently and this is elaborately documented in colonial records called the Lat Bhairo uh, riots uh, for five days there was carnage all over uh, the Hindus fought back uh, and there was uh, while the Brahmins and others they sat at the Ganga I believe uh, men and women they went on fast unto death saying the Ganga is now meli ho gai hai, dushit ho gai hai, we cannot any longer worship this but the Rajputs took it upon themselves and all of them go and almost 500 mosques or something are demolished there the Gyanwapi Masjid is actually set to fire and the Muslims are completely evacuated from that uh, entire mm -hmm. space and that time there is a very interesting uh, observation done by a, the British collector called Watson who I think gives us the prescription for today's solution to this problem he says this is a very very sacred spot for the Hindus mm -hmm. as attested in thousands of years of their scriptural evidence this uh, place means nothing to the Muslim community it is just a symbol of one of the uh, their rulers who has put something there so my advice is we should evacuate this completely and restore this to the Hindu community these people can build their mosque somewhere else now that was a very practical solution and once it happens now in independent India, we should probably uh, thank Mr. Watson for giving this <laughs> brain of an I brain wave of an idea. Even but that is not original. <laughs> <laughs> but then there was a bird, one Mr. Bird who comes there and then you know uh, has his droppings, which says no, 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 let's not, uh, <laughs> let's not do this. Let uh, sarva dharm samabhav, let them live together and all that. And uh, so that space is given to so only the mosque is. Uh, of the Muslim community this is of the uh, Hindu community and the compound around that is going to be for uh, the government property that's mm -hmm. the this thing but both these people right from 1857 once Awadh comes into English control after the uh, uprising the courts the Awadh courts have documentations of every case and they were fighting for the silliest of reasons this people tree belongs to me no this branch there is, that is coming into my yeah, area nobody Your should pluck the one, leaves yeah, up, yeah there's a toilet being constructed this house is mine all kinds of things so it was never free from reclamation now the flashpoint comes in 1936 where a very important case uh, Deen Muhammad versus the state uh, is filed where Deen Muhammad was a normal, I mean, common Muslim uh, who also takes the Anjuman in Tazamiya Masjid, which uh, controls the uh, mosque, also to court and says, now the usual uh, this thing now you don't limit your namaz only within the mosque you start spreading outside also and mm -hmm. take the entire uh, compound and the British were against that they say it's creating traffic jams it is creating lot of problems here law and order so you have to restrict yourself inside that mosque only but the Alvida namaz during the Ramzan Fridays they all started spreading outside this and so this Deen Muhammad and gang they take the matter they take the British government to court so it's a non-representative suit where the Hindus were not made party to it so the findings were also not binding on the Hindu community but the case becomes very interesting only because it lays bare for the first time all the contours of the dispute and you'll be shocked to see if you read that the same arguments are made by the Anjuman in Tazamiya Masjid today, even today, today. Yeah. you know they tried all kinds of subterfuge to say 
uh, that was not the Vishwanath temple, it was actually Dara Shiko's uh, Sanskrit school. No, no, it was actually Akbar's Dinne Ilahi, uh, you know, Ibadat Khana. Now, all of that is rubbished by the British judge in 1937 in his judgment. And very clearly, he brings out a few points which become important. One is he notes that this is not a Waqf property, uh, that there is no Waqif or donor. Uh, Aurangzeb may have ordered the destruction of the temple, but there is no Badshahi Farman to show in its place you build a masjid or I will donate uh, this land to, he is the owner of the entire land as a king, but he should donate it. That is how the waqf thing uh, works. So, the so Mutawalli would not have records for it. Mutawalli so has no records. So, in the British times too, they could not produce any records. So, the British judge says, you know, this is not a waqf property, the entire area. Uh, and interestingly, I think they didn't take it too far, but then they brought, uh, also invoked Islamic law and they said in the Sharia, you, if you encroach someone's property and do your prayers and namaz on it, it is haram, it is not Kabul. So by Islamic law also, this place is not actually a mosque, but then for the larger interest, let's give it uh, to them, at, but you restrict yourself only to that mosque area. Inside, and yeah. Deen Muhammad takes this to the Allahabad High Court in 1942, and the Allahabad High Court also dismisses this with cost to the plaintiffs, uh, and so till then, uh, when you talk about religious character, places of worship and all of that, pre-independence, the religious character of this spot at least was perpetually in dispute. It was not considered not to be a mosque and there were lots of shadows about what exactly was the nature of this property. It's interesting that the British court took just one year to give it's Nikal, but <laughs> Mr. Rastogi's uh, suit, which was filed on behalf of the deity in, I think, 1991, that took probably we, it's we are still glad that we have Sahih Deepak on the panel. If both of us are hauled and some <laughs> of them for co contempt of court, we know whom to <laughs> fall back on to <laughs> represent us. See, the interesting point is British courts were not limited by secularism. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we don't have the time to go in detail for this Deen Muhammad's uh, suite, but in his book he has uh, recorded all the testimonies in detail. So I think you should buy the book and read that part. And that shows, even though it was, as he says, it was a non-representational lawsuit, there were a lot of Hindus who gave testimony. There were historians also who gave testimony. And they have proved without doubt that Hindus never abandoned the place. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go in that detail. So now again, we fast forward to post-independence India and the places, the, the big bugaboo in the room, the Places of Worship Act, which is what is quoted by everybody on the other side. Every time they start to whine about something, ki why is the court ordering ASI survey of this temple, Places of Worship Ochala. Act, blah, blah, blah. Any, any, any uh, ASI survey that the court orders, this is the standard argument. You know, what about the Places of, places of Worship Act? So, first of all, I would like you to tell the audience a little bit about the Places of Worship Act. And I know he has said it's a draconian act. I agree it's a draconian act. You agree it's a draconian act. But it also has some exceptions. So I would like to tell uh, you to tell the audience a little bit about it. So the thing is, the mosque that he refers to, hmm. where the Bindhamada Mandir actually originally existed, is the uh -huh. Dorara Mosque. Uh -huh. Okay. I represent the Kashi family, both with respect to the Razia Mosque as well as the, the Bindhamada Mandir. Basically, hmm. we're saying these are the original temples, so we want them back. Uh -huh. uh, since the matter still subjudice, nevertheless, since the other side is constantly talking about it, so it's fair game for me to talk about it. So, see, the point is very simple. This legislation was passed in September 1991. Yeah. With barely three days of so-called debate. Mm. And the BJP, which was in opposition then, is caught by surprise by the Congress because there was no advance notice that was given to the rest of the parliament that this was going to be tabled as part of the, the business for the day. So there was a procedural violation, which therefore they say there's a problem with which this is being taken. I mean, there's a problem in the manner in which this is being taken up. And then there are discussions barely for about two days where some kind of a response comes from the BJP saying, how can you actually undertake this exercise without even speaking with all affected communities across the country, where you find out how many people are actually laying a claim to these occupied sites so that we have a clear picture of what is the impact going to be of this legislation on existing litigation or existing claims. So, it is just written roughshod into this. Uh, I think uh, 
one of the columnists today, uh, Sri Balbir Punj. He was he was the member of the parliament then who was vocally opposing this as part of the BJP's opposition actually. Now my initial take for a very long time was that the legislation uh, legally prohibits us from reclaiming our places. Around 2020-2021, uh, around the period that uh, Vishnu had lodged his, or rather instituted his suit, I was terribly confused about the interpretation of two specific provisions of the Act, Section 3 and Section 4.3. As like the language is seriously problematic, it's not making sense. It's almost as if somebody has hoped that in the future somebody will notice this and pull a solution out of it. Mm -hmm. Because it was un done under Sri P. V. Narsimrao. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> because he... Hundred percent. Because the man, apart from being a hardcore uh, sadhaka, so to speak, um, was said to be in prayers when the disputed structure was being brought down. Yes. Okay? So he was doing a homa according to some people. Two, surely he wouldn't have come out with a legislation to bar. So it was in so the public perception of the person and the legislation were at conflict with each other. So okay. it, in typically, what happens is when you're trying to re reconstruct itihasa, the traditional approach is this: you know the general traits of Sri Ram, okay? You know what he is bound to do, what he is not bound to do, okay? If somebody provides you a certain instance which is going against every grain of what he stands for, you will immediately question the veracity of that interpretation. Because you are allowed to fill in those gaps in a manner which is consistent with this overall character, not otherwise. Okay. So applying the same logic, if Sri P. V. Narasimha was a proponent of this, how did he actually allow this? Now what happens is section 4.3 or section 4, there are two sections, I'm so sorry, the critical sections are 3, 4 and 5. Mm. 5 says that the Places of Worship Act shall not apply to the Ram Janabhumi dispute. Yeah. Okay? That takes you to another line of the argument, I'll come to that later. Which means no bar or no prohibition which is captured in this legislation shall affect the claim of the rival parties which are in litigation before the Allahabad High Court. Okay. That's point number 1. Now what 3 says is that the religious denominational character of a particular place of worship as it existed on 15th of August 1947 shall not change. Now, here's how a lawyer will look at it. Religious character is different from religious denominational character because denomination is a subset. Religion is a superset. Okay? Therefore, if you say the denominational character shall not change, you're only saying Shaivet hai, Vaishnavet nebani ga, Vaishnavet hai, Shaivet nebani ga, baat khatam. That's where it stands. Correct, Shia Sunni. So therefore, the point is, does section 3 apply to conversion from religion to religion as opposed to denomination to denomination is one question. Okay. Second is 4 says, Dekho bhai, the, there will be, uh, the, the, so 3 is the bar, 4 is the status quo, which is, Jo vaisa hai, vaisa ka vaisa rahega. 4.3 then goes on to say, if this happens to be a heritage structure or an archaeological structure, then the bar under all of the above provisions under section 4 under this section shall not apply. Does not apply yeah. Therefore, if you are able to establish that this is an archaeological structure which is defined under section 2 of the Archaeological Act of 1958 where it, it speaks of the Monuments Act and the remains also, archaeological remains, there are two separate definitions. One for archaeological monument and one for the remains. Both of them say, so saal se purana hai, to ye archaeological ho gaya. So the lawyer in Sri P. V. Narsim Rao decided that all our temples must be 100% over and above 100 years. Okay? Therefore, he says, Hindu, thoda dimag laga lo. Kabhi to chanakya niti ka upyog kar lo. So, please, I am giving you a gift from the past. Whenever you guys wake up, all you have to do is to undertake an ASI survey, establish that this is beyond 100 years. POW Act is not necessary, it is irrelevant to the conversation. Why is this crucial? Why is this crucial? I am proceeding on the basis, tum at ko rakho ya uthao, mujhe koi fark nahi padta hai. I have to be ready for plan B. Which is to say, the presence of the act, if it is held constitutional, shall not come in the way of my reclamation thanks to the express provisions of the act itself. Okay. That's point number one. Two, if you choose to interpret it in a way that defeats my claim, that is when I have to say, now I will challenge this on grounds of unconstitutionality. Tab tak main kyun that this stands in my way? 
रोड़ा है ही नहीं आप क्यों बोले कि रोड़ा है रोड़ा है वाई यू गोइंग ऑन सेंग दिस यू डोंट हैव टू से दिस आई ओनली हैव टू से दिस इज द एक्सप्रेस लैंग्वेज वी विल अप्लाई ऑल प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मोरलिटी ओके टेल मी हाउ डज दिस कम इन माई वे इन टर्म्स ऑफ रिक्लेमेशन अंडर द लेजिस्लेशन दैट्स इट ओके the moment you do this you'll realize that the reference to the archaeological act is not actually a coincidence there is a venice charter of 1964 that deals with how archaeological places are supposed to be maintained you have government regulations there is a national policy that was released i think in 2015 or 2021 where we have come out with detailed policies of that so what is the meaning of a heritage site what is the meaning of an archaeological structure is understood in law it does not need to be interpreted again therefore all we have to say is that asi and therefore there is no bar under the law which is why the other side constantly says you first decide this question on the places of worship act before you actually yeah, yeah. proceed with the asi survey because asi survey ho gaya to dood ka dudar pani ka pani ho jayega but uh, they sought to defeat this excavation even in alabath high court by the way there is a detailed judgment that they had that the alabath high court had to pronounce when there was such an opposition to the excavation because they said mandir tha hi nahi then they said agar hota bhi to humne nahi giraya so they said okay why do we get into this nonsense let's just dig and find out mm-hmm. then there was resistance because then archaeological evidence would establish that there are pillars yeah. with vimanas with the amalakas with the garud and everything everything that relates to vishnu temple motif sorry you're asking something yeah so i was saying uh, even in 2022 when uh, aim went to supreme court i think uh, justice chandrachud said that uh, asi survey i mean there is no th- there is no problem in trying to find out what Correct. existed before and so asi See, survey is okay the simple principle that you follow yeah. in these issues is the first forum which is supposed to take a decision on such an important issue which is relevant to a suit proceeding is the court of first instance namely the district court, district court. because your writ petition nahi hai ye it is a property dispute mm-hmm. so therefore it is for the kashi court to actually decide from there you have a problem where will you go the appellate court uh, yeah. from there you have a problem you go to supreme court yeah. you are actually rushing to the supreme court to say take away the power of the high, the local court mm-hmm. to decide what is for, first meant to do remember under the law the supreme court may be the supreme court however in matters where the district court has primary authority even the supreme court cannot interfere until a decision is rendered by the district court okay. therefore according to me for once constitutional morality has worked in our favor okay. <laughs> so now i think i think what he said uh, is so pertinent because fabricated history can keep going on and on Uh, and it's death knell is archaeology until archaeology comes into the picture correct and that After is why there is a mic drop moment <laughs> <laughs> so now and we come to the fabricated uh-huh. history i must mention i've mentioned it in uh, several forums but mm-hmm. it is important it's a very rochak manohar kahani uh, <laughs> which you know uh, my grows about my shefali ji this program will not go according to your timelines after this i will take one more <laughs> shot go on <laughs> no i have no problem i can they, i won't they don't have a problem uh, this, this is, is pune yeah. they will stay <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talking of fabricated history uh, just one instance and that i think sets the template as to how history was fabricated with specific reference to kashi vishwanath mandir now there is and this is quoted even now in, uh, in interestingly on social media in uh, television channels as to why aurangzeb destroyed first of all yeah. you deny that he d- didn't destroy but then there is another thing uh, so this was uh, spun in a nice fairy tale by this gentleman called dr bishambar nath pande uh, who was a congress member a great scholar of his times he was also the governor of odisha and several other uh, one sahitya academy padma uh, puraskar all of that and he writes in a paper called islamic culture in india or something where he details a story and it's a fascinating fairy tale so it says uh, you know aurangzeb was going on an entourage to bengal as i'm telling that i'll also bust some of the logical <laughs> gaps in that story so first of all if you see the all the documented biographies of aurangzeb he never went to bengal himself he only sent his commanders on expeditions but in this story he goes on this expedition now along with him there are all the hindu rajput rajas and ranis also going along with uh, him now the, this entourage then goes via varanasi uh, to reach bengal from agra it is going 
and they stop there and all the Hindu Rajas go to him and say, oh Jahapana, this is such a you know most sacred spot for us, can we stay back tonight and worship Vishwanath and, and being the generous you know golden hearted uh, <laughs> secular <laughs> emperor that Alamgir was, he said okay chalo, hum kuch kar lete hain pe, ruk jate hain raat ke liye and they all stay back. The th second loophole, the same Rajas who put the petition to go and uh, worship, they don't go themselves, they send their wives. Uh, and the third loophole is all the Ranis go unarmed without any security guards, Rajput, uh, you know, Ranis. So all these Ranis go, they take a dip in the Ganga, then go there and then worship Vishwanath and come back and a head count is uh, conducted, one Rani is missing. Now everybody search for her, she is not to be found, the Rani of Kutch. Uh, God knows who this uh, Rani actually is in reality because there is no date to this whole story by the way. It happened sometime in the history of mankind. So uh, and then when uh, Aurangzeb's uh, um, you know people go, soldiers go to look, it's a uh, typical 1950 Bollywood, uh, Hindi cinema uh, scene you know. There is a sliding door uh, of Kashi Vishwanath temple, there is a Ganpati Murti, the soldiers shift it and the door just slides apparently and then uh, there is a flight of stairs to the Tehkhana, which is right below the Garbhagraha of Vishwanath and there they find this unfortunate Rani wailing and howling and she has no clothes and all her ornaments are taken away. Is there a Brahmin villain in this? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, coming yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> So then they ask her the reason and she says rightly hmm. that oh you know I was molested and exactly. raped by all the evil Brahmin priests of Kashi Vishwanath. Typical Vish Salim Javed story. <laughs> <laughs> so she says that and uh, and they do this routinely you know the Brahmins here are so uh, crooked that they any wealthy pilgrim comes they uh, molest them and take away their wealth. So all the Rajas are so enraged their wives are enraged they go and put pressure on Aurangzeb saying this is a place of Satan so just break this thing down. Hmm. Aurangzeb did not want to do it but they just force <laughs> him, chalo karlo, please hamare liye karlo. So it was on Hindu pressure that hmm. poor secular Aurangzeb went and destroyed hmm. the Vishwanath Mandir and I think my very dear friend Audrey Trushki also I think uh, subscribes, quotes, to, subscribes to these uh, stories in her hagiography. Uh, and we don't know which Rani was found in Mathura temple which he broke or Somnath that he broke or there are other stories there. Now when you go to the source, like any good historian, you go immediately to the source. To this Bishambar Pandey story, if you trace back the source, it goes to Pattabhi Sitaramaya, who was the Congress president. He wrote the history of Congress. History of the Congress party whom hmm. Gandhi ji favoured and so on and uh, um, he writes in this some feathers and stone okay. or some such book just see the subterfuge um, underscoring that he says I was told this uh, by a friend that there is a certain mullah in Lucknow who has a very rare manuscript in his possession which talks about this story. Now my friend told that this mullah will bring me that manuscript but before that that my friend died and so I could not get that manuscript from that mullah. But this is the larger uh, you know consensus about why Kashi Vishwanath Mandir was destroyed. So you know unnamed mullah unknown manuscript, unknown, unknown friend, friend are all sources but the same people will say Masre Alamgiri which was written during Aurangzeb's mm -hmm. time two years after his death and it was commissioned to Sakit Mustaid Khan by Aurangzeb giving all his court papers saying you chronicle my rule that is uh, you know suspect but this particular story uh, Pattabhi Sitaramaya writes in the 1930s and in fact uh, the great historian from uh, Pune uh, Gajabhav Mehendale hmm. I think he and Sanjay Dikshit ji told me this that uh, Mehendale sahab was told by N.C. Gore or somebody hmm. who heard from we can also do this I hear you so hear. So he was the librarian of Bori. Yeah. <laughs> N.C. Gore was the librarian Lib of Bori. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So he was told himself, Goreji was told by Sita Ramaya that I actually a kapol kalpit uh, kahani tha which I created to create Hindu Muslim syncretism. Correct. So you just see the kind of venomous manner in which history has been used and historians have been employed and once all you have to do is plant one falsehood 
then there is circular referencing mafia which comes into play i uh, quote him then he quotes you then yeah. you quote her and and then we all peer review journals each other and then it becomes the fact yeah, it's of a citation one yeah. uh, like and travel so many times before that it, the truth is the time to try it shoelace shoelace yes <laughs> <laughs> so that is and there are in this uh, you know also quote marxist historians who take this up and in their mm. word salad and academics of history they put some more layers as to why this temple uh, as told by sita ramaiya and bishambar pande gargi chakravarti k n panikar have named all of them that this is the subterfuge these mm. people have done and uh, they say there was a sufi rebellion uh, and again the pandits collaborated with the sufi rebels and so to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, punish the pandits they destroyed the kashi vishwana temple that is a marxist interpretation of that now there too there were a couple of sufi rebels who went and hid in a mosque there aurangzeb went and pulled that fellow out and uh, got him killed but he, he didn't go and mosque. destroy the mosque uh. but in this case it's not as if the temple belonged to the pandits even if they collaborated and uh, you know rebelled it was not their property that he he could have caught them and hanged them which he would have done very happily he there was no reason for him to destroy so everywhere cover fire for the basic tenet of that theology which talks for destruction of another viewpoint and couch it in so much and gore's uh, mr gore's testimony will be clear that it was done clearly on the advice of so and so to create this uh, ganga jamuni tehzeeb animal which we have never heard of much <laughs> thing is in law this would be not just one degree of hearsay multiple degrees of hearsay <laughs> but here's the thing and this is crucial this is not the first time this trope is being used in the con- in the context of the destruction of a temple when they speak of destruction of somnath by ghazni they say he was invited by the people there to lift uh, to actually relieve them of the torture of the brahmins mm. this is a professional historian saying about the repeated ransacking of somnath there is an a new version to that now Which a, is? a much improvised version i think social media historians with eye shadows and all of that they so apparently pre arabic uh, uh, you know pre islamic uh, arabia there were lots of deities mm. uh, so there was a this thing called sumanat or something there i see so that has become yeah, yeah, somnath yeah, yeah, here yeah. so mohammad yeah. ghazni thought yeah. that maybe that sumanat has traveled all the way to somnath mm. and therefore to destroy the uh-huh. sumanat yeah. of arabia he came and destroyed but i don't know he also destroyed mathura so th- what krishna was which pre arabic name uh, one it's mat and ahura from ahura mazda understand <laughs> so see here's the point just think of this for a moment remember this and the re- there's a reason i dropped the brahmin line and i'm in pune so i might as well say it the point is this the brahmin is typically presented as the villain in marxist historiography across the board to justify all sorts of horrendous crimes against the hindu community and to justify conversions that's been their strategy mm-hmm. i just missed out on the section 5 angle i'll just explain that that's very crucial yeah. so section 5 says that the places of worship act is not applicable to ram janmabhoomi dispute mm-hmm. so which means when the judgment is being delivered in the context of ram janmabhoomi you shouldn't expect any discussion on the places of worship mm-hmm. act at all yeah because it is irrelevant to it true i think 10 paragraphs from paragraph 85 onwards speaks of why places of worship act is a crucial piece of legislation to protect secularism of the indian constitution in a judgment relating to a dispute to which the legislation does not apply why did it why did somebody feel the need to discuss and defend the places of worship act because the idea was ek mandir de rahe hain baaki ke darwaze band kar rahe hain ab chup baitho hmm that is the message that was being sent yeah fortunately again constitutional morality protects me because the law says if an issue is irrelevant to the dispute at hand any discussion by the court on that issue is not legally binding okay which means we get to say this was obiter dicta which means it is extraneous observation that is not relevant to the central dispute at hand therefore even if it is delivered by five judges of this court as part of the ram janmabhoomi verdict it shall not come in the way of the challenge to the places of worship act the other argument being if the challenge needs to be even let's say mounted in the first place okay okay so look at how historians say something then there is cover fire provided through let's say through verdicts which basically says that this is how we will defend the legislation so that this doesn't pave the way for future litigation on these aspects 
So which please understand this. Which brings me to the next question, and I think uh, we all three of us at least are agreed on this that there is no, there should be no cap on only this much and no further. Correct. Yes. But my question to you is that I believe that every temple which has been turned into a mosque or a church needs to be reclaimed. But the point is there is no one figure that right now can be quoted and said that this is the figure. So one is how do we come to that survey? How right. do we decide? Right. Secondly, how do we decide the order of priority? and how do we go about it? My That's question is more about the for. modality of it. There are and this, three is a, ways. this is a question for both of you. Yeah. A, there are three ways and I think I've discussed this before. The first thing is, the, one of the first things that the government should have done before it promulgated this legislation was to undertake a law commission report to find out how many places are contested places, how many claims are outstanding. Hmm. That was never done. Okay. okay. Therefore, the period from 91 to now should be discounted as part of this entire process because we have to say, Ever since you put this law in place, people have abandoned their claims or at least they have not been allowed to present it. Okay. So prior to 91, how many such outstanding disputes were pending? Okay. First question. Second, when Ram and Janabhumi was being contested, nobody asked Korn Iski Ladai Ladaiga. Hmm. People formed their own groups yeah. and then others joined the entire movement. That is how this should happen, which is to say, if it is my Kuldevta place, hmm. we will fight. There are people who will do it. So, those communities which have a direct relationship with that particular temple will take it up. Just like you have Akhadas which did it from Ramjana Bhumi, you will have others do this. That's two. Three, the simpler way forward is the constitution of a truth and repatriation tribunal. Huh. Wherein you basically say, the government says, enough is enough where this matter is unnecessarily contested in different courts of law. God knows when this will resolve. You want to strike a balance between the right of reclamation and preservation of public order. Correct? That's your simple funda? Okay, great. Then constitute a committee which will basically look at the evidence presented with support of the ASI, institutional support of the ASI and the only option from there has to be to the Supreme Court. It's a two-step process. That's it. Finish this in a step-by-step -step fashion, create a separate team altogether. Now people might say, pe itne sare cases already padhe hain, then why, why should we actually constitute another thing? Look, if you feel the need to protect a corrupt politician from let's say from, from conviction, you are capable of constituting fast track courts, which never fast track themselves. Yeah. Okay? So I am saying this is something that has been festering for generations together. You have tried to put this to bed, it has not worked. You might as well give it an institutional resolution once and for all. Two, how does this, let's say, how does the losing party benefit from this? Well, the Supreme Court has showed the way, Mr. Watson has shown the way. The other thing is, I am also making the point, are bhai, how could the concept of a waqf come into existence unless and until it was based on conquered land? <laughs> hmm. The fact that you have so much of land, actually the bulk of it is those lands which belong to the temple. Yeah. Because it's not just the temple that was occupied, but all the related lands. lands yeah. So the common aspect of both Kashi and Ayodhya is that when the waqf records were looked at for the purposes of Babri, they would find that there was a handwritten interpolation with respect to the waqf being created in the context of Ayodhya. How is this suddenly handwritten and this comes at a later point of time? Because there are periods until when there is no such record in the work record whatsoever. The Mutawalli who is supposed to be the record keeper has no such record. Out of the blue it comes about after the litigation has started. Once the litigation started, actual manuscripts authored in Arabic and Persian went missing in multiple seminaries across the country. Because whitewashing happens in two layers. Hmm. Arabic or Farsi to Urdu, Urdu to English is the second level of whitewashing. Yeah. Okay? By which time once it reaches English, the process of secularization is complete. <laughs> so this is exactly how evidence has been tampered across the board. So I would say this tribunal must have the right of access to institutions All across the board so that nothing goes missing. It is possible for this to happen because you have to realize ultimately this issue falls within the exclusive domain of the government of India, which is the union government. If they choose to come out with a solution, all this litigation can be put to bed in one stroke. Okay. Vikram, your yeah. opinion on the same I mean, issue. it's a law, so I will stick to whatever Sai Deepak has said because I'm not the expert there. But I think as a historian, the responsibility of historians and scholars of the Hindu Samaj at large would be to create this, uh, you know, list also uh, as to even if you are going to take it to court, 
especially if you are going to take it to court, you will need a lot of evidence. Uh, if it is an out of court settlement, which is unlikely, but Correct. a very ideal situation, uh, then it is okay, goodwill this and that and all that. But if you are going to go to court, you have to marshal a lot of evidence. And we saw that in Ayodhya, that our evidentiary value was so high. And same in this case too. Uh, I think uh, Vishnu and his father, they plan to give copies of this book to all the judges, so that this is actually, uh, you know, proof with all sources cited. Correct. So that hard work, uh, I think Hindu Samaj needs to do. Correct. We are uh, usually lazy in, on that front. Uh, slogans and this thing is, is a nice thing. But then someone who gets to the field, dirties your hand. And even if you have to go to another side and say, give us our uh, sites back, the other side will ask, how many? Batao kitne hai? Correct. Kitne admi the? Yeah. Correct. So Correct. then you have to say, I have. So, uh, Sita Ramji has done the initial work of some 1826 or something and Correct. he says it's a tip of the iceberg. Correct. So, but then it could be anything, it could be 20,000, 40,000, it could be 4 lakh, it could be anything. Uh, because, you know, in, as I said, Hassan Nizami in his account says in that one invasion in 1194, thousand temples were destroyed. So, in the 800, 900 years of Islamic rule, uh, saying 40,000 is not a uh, big deal. It Correct. could be much more than that. But then Hassan Nizami also says 1,000, but he doesn't say which are the 1,000, what are the names, where are they located. So that hard work we need to do, which uh, we generally don't. We are given to a lot of rhetoric, we are given to a lot of excitement. Quietly, I think this should be done and we shouldn't even be discussing it openly either in platforms or in media, <laughs> etc. Quietly, groups should sit together and uh, that is a strategic way of doing it, a Savarkarite strategy of how to uh, actually get what you want uh, and then have this list ready so that the minute this commission or so on, so on if at all it gets formed, we have hope uh, in the future, we have this document ready saying this is what we want and these are the things to reclaim. Fair enough. Which brings me to my last question before I open the floor to the audience, uh, which is again, it going into your last point, we're talking about the future. And I agree that Hindu society as a whole needs to do a lot more work in documenting, in doing the historical field research. We have said and expressed enough angst about the lies that have been told to us by Marxist historians. Now that is done and dusted. What is the way forward? The only way to counter it is by writing books like you have written or Sai has written, which are meticulously researched and which break down the propaganda. So how do we encourage younger scholars to get into this field and not just write emotional WhatsApp messages or emotional Facebook posts, but do well-documented, meticulously researched books? Correct. That's an excellent question, Shefali, and I think I always emphasize on this that the only and only alternative to di distorted history is alternative scholarship. And we have to, have to invest in that. It is a lot of hard work. Uh, those of us who uh, do this research, we know that it is not an easy task to dirty your hands, to all face the backlash, that is another thing, that's okay. Correct. But just the task is so, uh, you know, laborious. So in that, a small uh, step that at least I have taken is this foundation for Indian historical and cultural research. Uh, thank you. Which does exactly what you said, you know, foster new uh, scholarship in Indian history. Um, and I'm not disparaging the social media battles or screenshots and all that. That has its own place, uh, you know, uh, to counter on a real-time basis and so on. But social media is very ephemeral. Tomorrow, YouTube may shut down or X, Twitter became X, X may be banned or something. Then all your evidence will just go down. And, you know, in our in non-left circles, the, our best pastime is to sit, have one panel or session on Marxist distortion of Indian history <laughs> and then have this voodoo doll and then keep uh, putting <laughs> pins to Romila Thapar, Irfan Habib, <laughs> DN Jha, this, that. But we just don't realize that that, that time has passed. Yeah. I mean, Arun Shauri, in eminent historians, he has already documented all this 30 years ago, 25 years ago, where he has debunked them. And they have debunked themselves in the Ayodhya, uh, you know, case where even someone like Irfan Habib, the kind of lies that on that Vishnu Hari inscription uh, that fell from the structure, uh, Meenakshi Jainji's mm -hmm. book talks in detail how the kind of testimonies they gave in court. It's a, it's a, it's a saga in itself. It's more colorful than Bishambarji's uh, fairy tale. You know, they say we got all our evidence from Times of India articles, whereas the VHP is giving you documents and documents of Puranic and Persian literature and all of that. We are not, we were asked by somebody. It's, it's fascinating. So, uh, that 
ship has passed where we keep on criticizing, criticizing. We, I think the time for action has come now, where you can say, let's remove Romila Thapar's books on ancient <coughs> India. But what do you substitute it with? Even to this day, in uh, we have not had a alternative ancient India history or medieval Indian history and so on. Even now, universities have those as the textbooks for UPSC uh, preparation. These are the textbooks. So unless somebody does this back-end work to give this new knowledge and jnanam paramam balam, there is nothing more supreme than knowledge, th this, uh, uh, you know, just talking about it will not help. So in the foundation, two things that we plan to do. One is of course give out fellowships uh, to aspiring scholars, young scholars across India with the idea that for one year you will be given a substantial amount of money to uh, foster that research and the ask is at the end of it you should come out with a publish worthy manuscript uh, which will be published. So every year if five, six, seven books come out, just imagine in 10 years there will be an entire supply chain of about 100 new books that will come. <laughs> and these books can then go and replace all those other toxic uh, you know, uh, literature which has already existed. The other is the foundation also hopes to take on proactive research on certain historical themes which are of importance con uh, contemporarily and we are planning to seed that in educational universities, institutions. So a pilot project which uh, we are going to start maybe from June or so is on the rise and fall of Buddhism in India which is I think very important to know because so that every time we start claiming this someone doesn't say a stupa is sitting somewhere under something. So but for that too and we are seeding it very uh, you know uh, thinkingly in Nalanda University, which better place to have that. But importantly, like I mentioned earlier, the knowledge of the classical languages uh, is important in this. Otherwise, it's just regurgitating what is already existing. So a Sanskrit scholar, a Prakrit, Pali scholar, an archaeologist, a geologist and a modern historian, we plan to sit together. It's an experiment. We've not tried it earlier. We'll see how it goes. We'll sit together, try to arrive, go to the primary source, see what the primary source says and based on that draw uh, you know conclusions that that could be journal articles it could be books it could be whatever but one needs to start that churn somewhere to only then i think one can ensure that over a period of time otherwise still then we can also keep blaming the government they have and in 10 years we haven't had any change to the history textbooks which is True. very very sad we've had hrd ministers who say not a word has been changed as if it's a matter of pride it should be a matter of shame but let it be let us not keep on being negative talking government has other priorities let us at least produce this parallelly and once it is produced maybe the it's easy to for them to say acha chalo isko add kar do in the syllabus make that the part of the upsc training or something so that hard work that research i think what savarkar did uh, in 1907 uh, 067 when he went to uh, london sat in the british library used those records to write that seminal book on 1857 calling it the first war of Indian independence, we need more Savarkars today who can actually <laughs> use that history, use that history for our civilizational battles. We have never given importance to history, unfortunately. And all our civilizational battles, uh, other than law, the only other problematic area, and even the law, legal thing cases are, are based, based on, on historical yes. uh, Correct. problems. Correct. So unless we put our history stable in order, which the other side has very assiduously done, because they know that is the core uh, you know, essence of identity, of civilization, everything. So you manipulate that the game is over but we have not done that uh, and even so even our Sanskrit Pandits and others they've never used their Sanskrit knowledge for historical research only on Vyakarana Shastra which is all great I mean in its own place it's great but why not use that knowledge also for historical research all our history lies in those texts and if you're using English translations you are limiting your worldview to just 200 250 years for a 5000 year civilization 6000 year old civilization it's a very narrow pinhole to see that whole uh, scenery with. So I think this is one small attempt. I really don't know how it will work and especially in Pune 
especially in a city which actually you have the Bhandarkar Institute, you've had the Nationalist School of Historiography coming from your city. Correct. When James Mill came up with his uh, diatribe against Indian history, it was uh, scholars from this city who wrote anonymous letters saying the first Hindu, the second Hindu to uh, debunk everything that he said. And in some way that laid the foundations for this so-called Nationalist School of Historiography, Rajwade, Bhandarkar, all these people. So I think in Pune uh, and with your help, scholarly, monetary, this, that so many multiple ways of help or just patronage and encouragement and then dissemination of that information through social media channels and all of that, yeah. Pune Sambad, uh, these platforms, I think that is the only and only way forward if we have to win this battle from a very, you know, scholastic and a bodhic, uh, you know, kind of a uh, direction. To all the young budding historians in this hall. There is a book in Pune waiting to happen, waiting for Puneshwar. If any of you are willing to take up the challenge. And when you write all these books and uh, get into problems with leftist historians, please befriend one lawyer, always. <laughs> because it will help you file defamation suits, it'll, all kinds of allegations will come on you. So if anyone here wants to become a historian, also start cultivating, I think, a very thick hide. No sensitive uh, nature, correct, correct. nothing. Because every uh, weapon will be unleashed against you to bring you down. Sai is on everybody's, all of our speed dials for the same reason. <laughs> Uh, shall I open the floor to questions? Yeah. I just have one request. Just ask a question, please, and stick to the point because so that more people can be accommodated. Uh, in the interest yeah. of time, we really have to do just two questions because uh, the, the speakers have been so one. generous with their uh, talk. <laughs> and first, let's give them a big round of applause once again. Uh, it it really felt like we are a part of a conversation in Shefali's drawing room and it was as fluid and as conversational as it could get. So thank you uh, all three of you for such a wonderful evening for the audience. One question from this side, one question from th that side. From the left and yes. right. Yes, democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go ahead with the question? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, first of all, grateful to be here and being these in interesting times. I'm Rohit from Pune. So like uh, it was spoken that there are 40,000 or more temples who need such attention across the country. So do we need to have a think tank like you people are there, a strategic group who will guide the temples across the country? It could be in very remote places also. So how do we go ahead? Like for example, Puneshwar. See, one of the things that I have tried to say uh, or at least share with organizations which operate in different societies or different uh, cities is that if you want to occupy the same space as other organizations, you're constantly hoping to reinvent the wheel. The one space which actually does not have too much of competition and where there's a dearth of talent is actually research, as he rightly said. Perhaps the only point that I would add is that the state can play two roles. One is, it is its job to incentivize something that a private interest will not. So the state's job is to be a loss-making machine by default, in fact, where there is no return of direct investment that is actually expected. So that can happen. Two, considering that there is a huge audience which is consuming this entire work, clearly the atmospherics are ready, the audience is ready to consume this through textbooks. So when the society puts together the repository of knowledge, the megaphone or the state shall create the multiplier effect by putting it through textbooks. Now what I would suggest is when there are research, uh, let's say organizations which put together the material and the rest of the society starts building pressure on the state saying, why are you still not mainstreaming this after years of being in power? What is your excuse today? Because today you can't say that there is no repository, there is no scholarship, there is no primary scholarship. All of that is done and dusted, at least in some areas. So I would believe that thinking elite groups of each, of each city should take it upon themselves to actually show the way in terms of cultural leadership. Allow me to say this even if it sounds elitist or classist. Even in the realm of culture, the Pareto principle works, which is 20 people actually lead and do the work, the rest of the 80 people typically follow. Okay? The idea therefore according to me is not to convert an entire city. I always look for strategic intervention in those parts of the society which can, let's say, create an example for others to follow. 
See, let's look at it this way. If everybody could be a sub worker, we wouldn't have a problem, right? The point is, what do you do for those who are not built in the sub worker mold in terms of spine, but have effectively the scholarship that is needed? Because aptitude has to meet spine in these areas. You cannot survive this battleground without actually having spine. According to me, 60% is subject matter knowledge, 40% is patience to withstand the nonsense that comes your way. And the patience to sit through absolute mediocrity when they keep on saying the same thing over and over again. Okay? Mafi nama likha. Absolutely, mafi nama lik diya. That's how they keep writing. So, what I'm trying to say is, to, to address this, perhaps the city's financial elite, the money back, so to speak, I would request them, please go back to the original contributions of the Vaishya community, where it was their entire job to co come out with endowments to support scholars. Okay? Temples where the, where the path from which this would be funneled previously, I go back to my pet topic, but independent of that, until that happens, I think it falls upon the city's intelligence here to identify this and start incentivizing this. Otherwise, it remains a storm in a teacup where it, it is fantastic for us to discuss this in these sessions, but it has to go beyond the air-conditioned atmosphere and it has to reach the masses, which means primary scholarship can be in English. From there, where does it go? It has to come out in local languages. What is the point of it otherwise? Right? It has to reach the masses because ultimately, the voting masses, their minds are the tools of weaponization in the hands of these historians. Don't think that Marxist historians operate only in the English-speaking circles. Hindi, everywhere these guys are there. So, what is written in textbooks by them is ultimately converted into pamphlets which goes to places like Bastar. Remember that. So, you have to be able to look at catering to different segments of the population, but it starts from core primary research based hard score scholarship. That is the way to start it. So, if this has to happen, I would only request the those who have been abundantly blessed with Lakshmi to support Saraswati. <laughs> Last, last question, please. Uh, someone from this side. I'm so sorry. No, no, also Achha, the please. Yeah, you can ask, and then one question from this side. So you can ask. I think your mic isn't working. Sir. Other part of Savarkar, active part of Savarkar, Babara of Savarkar offers one lakh rupees to destroy <coughs> a Kashi Vishwanath mosque. Can you come to the question, sir? Because I yeah, think people are. The question is that how about the, if you get a more than 400 seat, 400 seat, you can amend the constitution of 1991 law? I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> But this question should be directed at someone else. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I've been saying this. Most of our litigations are unnecessary. The government can do a lot. I agree with you. There is no quarrel there. Last question, I think. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, a request to the volunteer. Only one question. Last one, please. On, on this, this side. side. Ask yeah. the lady. Yeah. My question Let's is to... to yeah. please, 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 please give it to the lady. Give it to her, yeah. 33%. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, 33. <laughs> no discrimination, both sides are represented. So. Three people are, one person is a girl. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am, please. Sorry, it's a one person conspiracy. Am I audible? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm really grateful here to hear you all. So, my question is uh, so, uh, you have both the uh, authors that you have mentioned so many barbaric incidents in the book. So, I just wanted to know your thought process, how you bring yourself back after reading everything, how you come back to the point, how do you come back to the reality? Just wanted to know your thought process so that we can also imbibe that in us. <laughs> I wish there was an easy answer to that. It leaves you terribly di disturbed. I must say, you know, as Saidipak mentioned, those six months of uh, research and writing, I think uh, my dark circles went outside the spectacles because lack of sleep. E even in my dreams, I was seeing some shivalinga, some uh, dilapidated structures. It really takes a toll. It's not easy to do that. I think uh, uh, in my case, what has worked is a very deep spiritual anchorage. Uh, spiritual practices which uh, which works for me I nobody to prescribe the same thing to everyone 
but i think a historian or anybody chronicling history is called upon to become a moral eunuch uh, which is very difficult after so much of immersion in that particular uh, you know uh, subject obviously it uh, riles you up but while you are committing it to print uh, you are asked to take a distance and emotionally uh, state facts as it is and so there i think the larger message of uh, you know what kalhana had said about history itself itihasa the very word itihasa it thus happened so let it be a dry catalog of events uh, and uh, you know facts but the other aspect of itihasa dharmartha kama mokshanam upadesha samanvitam katha yuktam puravrittam itihasa ta chakshmate uh, you know the uh, katha yuktam uh, the uh, in a very story format puravrittam the narratives of the past told to you in a story format in the achievement of the four purusharthas of dharmartha kama and moksha but importantly it should also have a didactic element to it an upadesha samanvitam uh, moral fabric right wrong all of that itihasa ta chakshmate that is called history which it in turn is it thus happened so i think that needs to be a larger you know template uh, there has to be storytelling there has to be an adherence to facts and there has to be a societal message also and our ancestors have given a very clear self assured uh message as to what the utility of history writing is is it just for the heck of writing something or is there a larger message a social uh, charter also for this chronically i think that becomes important if you are going to and that's the best i try to adhere to so that my own angst my biases which are dying to come out <laughs> so there is this uh, introduction page where i let loose uh, it takes about 10 15 pages where all the bile all the thing is vomited out but then in the rest of the book it is just as if you know you're sitting from the outside and looking at kashi's temples being broken to smithereens the shivalinga being pounded and put on the steps of masjids and all of that which is the sad responsibility that is put on a historian's shoulder fortunately i am not a historian <laughs> so uh i don't need to uh play the game of neutrality the only thing is i still fall back on facts only from a strategic perspective to deprive the other side of an argument i look at it from a litigator's perspective to when i wrote the second book the final chapter of it was on the mopler rights uh the The, i have i have a picture for every uh, chapter so the 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 picture for that is the mopla sword the mopla knife in fact because i wanted this to be a stark reminder to people of kerala and everybody else as to what is it that has happened to their ancestors in the past barely a century ago i finished it at 2 am on 20th of june 2022 and by the time i was done with it i broke down but the one thing that i've learned to do with time is never allow this anger to dissipate never ever allow it to dissipate <laughs> and never let it become omnipotent ventilation or rather i'm so sorry impotent ventilation let it become omnipotent ventilation because the point is you need to know how to use there is no better weapon than anger according to me provided you know how to channel it exactly it can be just uh, let's say a tube light or it can be a beam of laser so how you choose to channel it and how you choose to summon it at will when you need to to make an impact that i think is the trick <laughs> apart from of course spiritual mooring so one of the things that you're expected is of course there's a thick skin 100% yes <laughs> but remember one thing what you're seeing or what you're going through is not even a fraction of what people have already seen absolutely and you have the benefit of telling their stories and yours today be grateful count your blessings but you have to be a part khatriya when you actually get into this for you to undertake this activity there is no other option i would only tell people one thing in a narrative war every forum every medium has its job it has its own place but the strongest weapon always is your ability to marshal facts your ability to articulate which comes with a lot of hard work so every pain or every ounce of pain that i take from history i sew it back with respect to the next book saying now i'll come back with a vengeance i will give it back to you with interest you wait and watch okay that is exactly how i operate it has worked for me now whether it will take a toll on me that's what time to say <laughs> okay ma'am the second question from this side this can be the last one it would be fair 
So, so Sai, it's the question to you actually. Uh -huh. We have uh, around more than 50 laws which are anti-Hindu. So, it includes Work Board Act or it can be the yes, Place of Worship Act. Can we have a account from you or maybe a book in making from you which we can refer and understand how the governments in past have made it the way it is today, the anti-Hindu. I have to finish the third book this year. The fourth book ends next year. With that, the series is complete. After that, I'll take a break from writing for a while, simply because I am not an author. I don't want the tag ever to be used for me, simply because it has to be used for people like, uh, uh, like Vikram, who actually do this full time. As a litigator, my battlefield is different. These books are meant to support and strengthen the battles of court. That has been my strategic investment as far as book writing is concerned. Okay? Otherwise, I wouldn't have undertaken this task. The second object, of course, was to shut up people who said, Tumhari taraf se intellectual uh, scholarship kaan se hai, ye kaan hai. I said, okay, to bad jab hai, I'll do it, you wait. So, other than that, I have no interest in constantly doing this. I believe in weaponizable knowledge because we are no more in the realm of pure academic scholarship. Everything has become political, everything is a battleground. So I will take up only stuff which I know for a fact can be used on the other side, period. So with that, I hope I've answered the question. Um, thank, you. Sabha. thank you, thank you. And I'm going to be the villain here. I'm sorry, sir. We have to close. This is, this is, this is regarding the sour I'm going to request to this take is the mic this question. To respect the moderator. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Movie? And it has been a wonderful audience as well. So a big round of applause for all you people who have spent your Friday evening. Uh, literally, I, there was pin and I, drop I, silence while Anilaji, just, uh, the speakers. Uh, two, yes. three people I just wanted to thank. Yes. Uh, one is, of course, Manoj. Manoj is back here. Uh, he and his entire team, I think they've been so passionately involved uh, in putting this together. It has, it's not been an easy task for them, so extremely thankful to uh, them. And my friend Pushkar Lele, who's there. Dr. Pushkar is, a, uh, is an amazing Hindustani vocalist and someone who also helped immensely in putting this evening together, al along with, of course, all of you. Thank you so much for coming here to share my joy on this very, very significant occasion. Thank you. And uh, there is, uh, as you all know, the book, uh, the sale of the book is going uh, outside. And there's also going to be a signing by the author. I'm going to request all of you to do this very peacefully and in a very disciplined manner. Uh, I request the volunteers to be a little hard in uh, doing this. With this, I sign off and I'm going to invite Mr. Manohar Dapkara for a quick and official vote of thanks. Uh, I hope uh, you have a, a good evening, a peaceful and a happy weekend. And I hope Dr. Sampat's book will keep you reading. Thank you. Sabhi do minute ke liye jayenge. Jai Shri Ram. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Aaj ke karikram ke liye. मुख्यतः मंच पर व्यासपीठ पर विराजमान श्री साईं दीपक जी श्री विक्रम जी श्री शेफाली जी तीनों ने हमें जो समय दिया ये सभी एक इनका बिजी शेड्यूल है बिजी लाइफ है और जिस स्पष्टता विचारों की स्पष्टता से उन्होंने विचार रखे ये सब चीजें हम सभी को इनसे हमारे लिए अनुकरणीय है जैसा विक्रम जी और साई दीपक जी ने कहा हमें ज्ञान का भी अर्जन करना है और बल का भी करना है और सोका जो सेक्युलरिज्म है उसका चोला उखाड़ फेंकना है जिस क्लेरिटी से आप लोग बोल रहे हैं हमें उसी क्लेरिटी से समाज में जाके इस बात को रखना है यही टेक अवे हम यहां से लेंगे पुस्तक को पढ़ेंगे भी पचास लोगों को ये स्टोरी सुनाएंगे भी तो इसी के साथ हम जाएंगे साथ में मैं आज आभारी हूं आप सभी का साथ में पुलिस प्रशासन जिन्होंने हमारा कार्यक्रम में परवानगी दी पुणे महानगर ऑडियंस जो आप सभी चार बजे से बैठे हैं मैं देख रहा था यहाँ कई लोग चार बजे से आकर बैठे हैं कई बाहर सांगली कोलापुर से आए हैं उन सभी का अभिवादन प्रबोधन मंच पुणे संवाद प्रभा खेतान फाउंडेशन प्रभा खेतान फाउंडेशन से एहसास वुमन ऑफ पुणे प्रभा प्रभा फाउंडेशन श्री सुजाता जी सबनीस वो भी यहाँ हैं उनका भी अभिवादन और सभी कार्यकर्ता जिन्होंने इस कार्यक्रम में सहयोग किया राष्ट्रीय स्वयंसेवक संघ के भी कई कार्यकर्ता इसमें बैकग्राउंड में इन्वॉल्व हैं जिन्होंने व्यवस्था का सब जिम्मेदारी देखी है उन सभी का भी बहुत बहुत अभिवादन भविष्य में हम ऐसे जन जागरण के कार्यक्रम करते रहेंगे मैं आग्रह करूं मैं तो श्री विक्रम जी से आग्रह करूंगा क्योंकि एक नारा चला था एक समय में कोटि कोटि हिंदू जन का 
हम ज्वार उठाकर मानेंगे सौगंध राम की खाते हैं हम मंदिर वहीं बनाएंगे इस बार हम सौगंध महादेव की खाते हैं हम मंदिर वहीं बनाएंगे और इसके लिए हमें अब तीस साल या पांच सौ साल नहीं रुकना है आने वाले एक दो साल में ही कर कर रहना है तो हमें ज्ञान से भी तैयार रहना और जरूरत पड़ी तो शक्ति से भी तैयार रहना है अयोध्या केवल ज्ञान से नहीं बना शक्ति भी लगी थी हमें याद होना चाहिए नहीं तो सुप्रीम कोर्ट में तीस साल और फैसला नहीं होता तो इस सबका हम संज्ञान लेंगे वैसे Thank mm -hmm. you.